Hi, welcome. This is our pilot class introductory session where we will go over the basics of the program that will take you from idea to first draft over the next six weeks. My name is Connor. Thanks for being with us. Um, if you've been with Script Camp before, I think you probably know some of the basics by now, but if you're new, thanks for joining us. There's some audio tips here in case you're having trouble hearing or being heard, but the biggest thing is just check that mute button in the bottom left, that gray microphone icon. You have to click it to mute or unmute yourself and toggle it on or off. So if you can't be heard, and that might be why, please keep the mics muted unless uh, you have been called on or if I just throw a question to the room, which I do quite often. So you should be ready to speak out loud, and especially when we get to your project and your logline, you will be expected to answer questions about it and to have a interest, you know, a dialogue and um, be able to refine and workshop it as much as possible. So um, what is Script Camp? We are a screenwriting community focused on taking you from idea to first draft and then to more polished script depending on which courses and programs you choose. All over, this is just uh, a place to go to improve your writing and to, let's like going to the gym for writing. You're doing reps, running on the treadmill, and just building these skills necessary to put you on the road to becoming a working writer. We have lots of free classes and events and workshops like this one here, which is the first part of a longer boot camp that's coming up. There are um, There's a six week course that follows this on the same day and time slot. So Sundays, 11 to one Pacific time. So if you're interested in doing that, you'll have to sign up after this class to participate in the rest of them. Um, we have VIP member classes and boot camps like this. We have a feature boot camp, a rewrite boot camp, and we're adding more stuff all the time. Um, a little about me, I've been working and signed professional Hollywood writer since 2017. Have a script set up at a major production company in town, and I teach the boot camps in weekly, weekly writer's labs. Um, these boot camps are intended to take you from idea to first draft, except for the rewrite, which is going to take you from first draft to better draft. <clears throat> using these two hour weekly sessions this is once a week for two hours um there's eight weeks for the feature six weeks for tv and six weeks for stage play the stage class has concluded and is now just available on our video library we have gone four weeks for our rewrite and pitch boot camp as well and four weeks for our horror thriller and we're we actually have an upcoming sci-fi boot camp too so that'll be four weeks and that'll transition you from the first the first uh, the that mini boot camp will be like getting your story organized and getting totally ready to start and then it'll dovetail and transition into the feature camp afterwards so um, if you want to write a sci-fi movie coming up then saturdays uh starting um in two weeks from now will be the place to go so let's look at the overview for this class we'll start with this is this is week zero here it's the free class that so we go over the basics of pilots and pilot writing and workshopping your series and pilot log lines what is a log line that's that one sentence expression of the premise of your show so up until we get to that point in class, I would start writing down on your own computer, on your own you know, notepad uh, or note, sticky notes or Google Docs or something like that. Start writing down a version of a log line for the show that you want to spend the next six weeks writing. It doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't have to be complete. You might have, you might have different gaps or, or issues in it that need to be addressed. That's okay. This is, that's what this class is for, is to get you to a more clear picture of what your log line will be. For next week, um, you should try to, by the, um, by the conclusion of week one's class, so a week from today, you should have a finalized idea and you've a, an ideally a really polished logline. So um, your goal for this class is to come up with some kind of logline or idea for the show that you want to write. Try to write a, a one sentence version of it and we have many templates and um, suggestions for you to, to use if you're not sure where to start. Um, but we're gonna try to work on that and you're gonna answer questions about it and we're gonna try to figure out what your show is basically. Um, it's okay if you don't really know, and it's, no one starts out good at this, and um, it's, this is a challenge, but uh, throughout this class today, this will be half lecture and half workshop where we will be going through student log lines for the shows that you want to create. A pilot is like the first episode of a theoretical show that does not exist and will not exist, so we want to try to forget all these ideas of what about season three of my show, what about episode 12 of my show. Just writing, pilot, writing a fantastic pilot takes many years and like probably more than a dozen pilots of having been written before you are gonna get to that spot where you can actually write something fantastic. So don't worry too much about the quality. You're trying to write and execute something at a high level and finish it in reasonable amounts of time and get really good at this process of plan something or conceive something, plan it, execute it, revise it, and move on. If you do those steps and just keep going through scripts, churn through as many scripts as you can and using those steps, then you just will improve as a writer exponentially. So um, try to keep doing those things. Uh, what else? So week one is um, a little more about why this story and just what is making your pilot relevant universally and sort of right now. And what is the uh, the 
the final version of that series and pilot logline that you're going to be moving forward with. And we're also going to be filling out these things called sketchbooks, which are like just a place to aggregate all of your ideas, influences, and research materials into one spot. So you're going to be working on that this week. Actually, you know what? Before we do anything else, I'm just going to have everybody make your uh, sketchbook document. It's just so much easier to have something to be writing on. So where's that uh, slide? Just go to Google Docs and make a new document right now. Everybody who is participating or wants to participate in the class. And um, what you're going to do is call it the name of your idea. If you have an idea for the name of your show, then name of show and sketchbook. You can just call it sketchbook if you don't know yet or if you're not 100% sure what you want to do. But I just want you to have something that you're working on while you're listening to the lecture for the first hour of this class and to be revising and kind of adding stuff and um, just collecting and gathering influences and inspiration as we go. This is a document you're going to be working from um, as the basis for your outlining as you go forward. So you don't have to include anything on here. There's no wrong answers for things to include on here. You just want to be able to keep everything in the same spot. So make your new document now if you've not already done so. And um, in terms of things to include right now, just at the top, you probably want to put title or ideas for the title, the genre, really important to know exactly what your genre is. I've noticed a lot of script camp students recent, recently have been like, what's the genre of this? And they'll be like, uh, I guess it's this, but like, you should actually really know. Um, if you don't know what your genre is, then you've not, you're not going to know who to show this thing to or who would have the ability or interest to actually make that thing. And if you clearly don't know what your genre is, then you will lose a lot of confidence from your reader right off the bat. Um, so you absolutely have to know what your genre is really clearly. So title and genre, that's what you should write at the top of your sketchbook before anything else. Then we have some other stuff that you don't need to know what this means right away because we're going to get to this, but we have format and time slot, comps, series, and pilot log lines. So just write the title and genre for now and underneath it, start trying to figure out one sentence that's going to express who the main character is, what they're trying to accomplish, and what the sort of situation is that we're dropping into. Um, don't worry if you're not sure how to do those yet. If you do know already and you have a head start, then you can just you can get a little bit ahead. Um, but uh, if you're not sure, don't worry yet. We will get to many of these things. I just want you to be working and thinking, what is the show that I want to be making? What is that one sentence that's going to express what this thing is about? Okay, um, so I uh, normally I would stop and ask uh, take questions on that so far, but just because we're only a few minutes in and I want to get some more of the basics down, I'm going to wait a few more slides before taking questions. I'll just say... Make your document, start sketching out ideas for your logline. Okay, um, let's go back. So uh, this is like one of those <laughs> Breaking Bad style plots where we start with something exciting, then it flashes back two weeks earlier. Um, so we're kind of doing that. But regardless, let's flash back now to our overview. So week one is all about figuring out that logline. Week two is outlining the broad events of the story in the general chronological order they should go in. Week three is expanding that list out into what we call scene cards, which are a full paragraph for every single scene in the entire episode. So you're going to know what happens on every page. And, you know, you should be marking out the pages that these things are supposed to happen on so you can have an, an adequate way to a yardstick for your pacing. Um, and you can tell if you're ahead or behind of where you thought you would be. Um, and then we will actually start writing on week four. So this is half of the class's planning and uh, getting all your ducks in a row and making sure you know what happens on every page. And then the second half is actually, we call it go to pages. When you go to pages, that's when you start actually writing and formatting in proper screenplay format. You don't even need to get screenplay software until halfway through the class if you don't want to. The first half is on figuring out what the story is, organizing it really concisely, figuring out exactly how to express it, and then breaking, down, breaking the spine of the story to figure out what happens on every single page. So we are emphasizing this very excruciatingly methodical method here at Script Camp, but you might find... If this is new to you, that is actually very helpful, and you will no longer find yourself lost in the woods when you are in the middle of the script itself, not knowing where to go. I find that the biggest reason people don't finish scripts and therefore stumble out of the gate trying to get going doing this is because they don't plan enough. And so when they hit some kind of obstacle or they find themselves lost in the writing of the pages themselves, they just have to give up because they don't know how to fix it. They don't know where to go from there, and they feel like any changes they make are going to derail the rest of what they were going to do. So... Um, that's why you should get used to planning really detailed outlines and then sticking to them as much as possible and finishing them, even if it's not amazing. Um, so, uh, yeah, week four, first act, week five, second act, week six, third act. It's as simple as that. So you're going to be writing 10 pages a week if this is a half-hour show, 
or 20 pages a week if this is an hour-long show. Therefore, you are slightly incentivized to choose a shorter idea. If your options are half hour or full hour, you will have just less pages to fill if you are writing half hour. Um, the problem is rarely that people don't have enough pages and more often it's that they write too many pages. So if that is a concern for you, maybe you do want to choose an hour. Um, but the point is uh, you got to be consistent and in, in order to keep up with the benchmarks of the class, you really only have to be, if you're writing half hour, you're only writing two pages a day um, if you just worked on weekdays. So 10 pages a week is not terribly unreasonable to do. Um, 20 pages a week, you're writing four pages a day on weekdays. It's a little more, but um, you can definitely do it. Uh, and we've seen many students write their first scripts here at Script Camp and have a great experience with it. So I'm pretty sure that you can do it too. Um, okay, we have a question from one of our YouTube comments. Is this free? I'd love to participate. Do I just tune in each week? Hi, Elsie. Thanks for your comments. Um, this first class, this is the like free intro class. The rest of these, you have to be a member of Script Camp to attend. But you can totally stay. This is like a two-hour class that goes until 1 p.m. Pacific time. So you can stay and comment and participate in this whole thing or join us on Discord if you want to, um, where you can uh, unmute and actually speak to us and answer questions and things like that. And then if you want to participate in the rest of the class, you have to either you buy the course on its own or you can become a member of Discord, or I'm sorry, a member of Script Camp on Discord which comes with a free trial. So it comes with two weeks free trial. So if you sign up before next class, you'll get the fr those first couple class meetings and just access to a lot of other stuff. So um, feel free to stick around and we're glad to answer any more questions that you have. But if you wanted to see just a bunch more info, just go to scriptcamp.net and you can look up the details there. Um, thanks, Elsie. Other questions before we jump in? No other questions? Okay, we will just blaze ahead then in that case. So um, this the course is for you to write a first draft of a new pilot script. Um, it doesn't include feedback. So if you wanna get that feedback, there's ways to get it for free on our server. If you are swapping with other people, that's usually gonna be the best way to do it. If you do something for someone else, they're more likely to do something for you. And that can be a nice way to build these collaborative uh, groups for feedback and for helping each other. We have several groups that meet on the server, including, did we have our first meeting of the sketch group today, Nacha? Yes, and a new one starting on July 5th. Oh, oh, awesome. Cool. So yeah, we have several groups that are just starting up now. If you want to start your own group, you can even like create your own Avengers of your you know favorite people you'd like to work with. And um, you know, it's a nice way to get consistent feedback if you're all committed to this idea of we're going to be helping each other as we go along. You should do that if you want more consistent feedback because strangers are just not going to be super reliable. Um, we also have a rewrite boot camp that we have been trying to get up and running again. We just haven't gotten enough uh, signups for it to actually run. So on Saturdays, that's why we will be doing sci-fi starting in two weeks. Um, but uh, once we get enough students, we're glad to do another rewrite class. Um, you can also just get a consultation from me on the website if you want to, scriptcamp.net slash coverage and I will mark up the script and give you a half hour phone call where I will go through the major points and answer any of your questions. But don't worry about that now. The main point is you gotta write a new pilot. So if you wanna get the class on its own, scriptcamp.net slash classes. And if you wanna be a member, scriptcamp.net slash membership. If you plan to enroll but haven't yet signed up, you can use the little poll in our chat to get immediate access to the chat channel's video library, which includes recordings of all the other classes we've done and also just join our discussion. So. Um, tell us about you. What are your goals as a writer? What kind of pilot are you trying to write? Are you, would you, do you want to be a staffed TV writer? Or are you trying to make your own web series that you want to star in or something like that? Feel free to weigh in and tell us about your specific objectives for this course and for your project. Um, are we meant to speak? Like, can we answer? Or... Yeah, go ahead. Are we supposed to type? Either way. Oh, okay. Well, my name is Elsie. I was literally just on the YouTube and you said I should hop on Discord. So I hopped on Discord. Um, awesome. I have never written anything before, but I just have it in my heart to write this story. And it's kind of like semi-autobiographical based on my life. And I have zero training, so I don't know what I'm doing. But um, I would love to write a TV series and I want to try. So I'm really excited and I'm thank you for this kind of what you're doing. 
Sure, thanks for being here. I'm so glad we had somebody join from YouTube. We're, we're like struggling to get views on these different uh, platforms, so it's awesome. Um, yeah, you're in just the right spot. So if you don't know where to start, you don't have to like pay for the classes and sign up to get value out of Script Camp and to learn stuff, because we have had tons of free classes here and lots of free events and workshops and interviews and like all these great things that you can access to tr just like start learning the basics. Um, the main thing for you to do, I'll just tell you specifically, you, if you really want to write this show and you're passionate about this, you got to start reading. Um, before you even worry about how do I write this, how do I make this work, you got to start reading. Um, so that's why between every week of our class meetings, we say you have to read one full script from beginning to end, so it doesn't take that long, and be ready to talk about it. It's not like a quiz. There's not like right or wrong answers, but you must just start reading um, in order to get a sense of what these things look and feel like on the page. We've all seen a lot of TV shows in our lives, but very few of us have actually read the scripts end to end. Um, so in order to write, in order to be a great writer, you must be a great reader. Um, so if you look in our chat there, um, our co-founder Nacho has just left a link with a bunch of uh, pilots that you can read there. So start reading for sure, but this is a great place to be. If, you're, if you just want the basics, this is like how to write a pilot 101. Thank you. Thank you. Um, somebody else want to weigh in? Goals as a writer? I want to, my short-term goal, learning a lot from you, is to churn out 10 pilots and just master the craft of like how to write so that I can get to the point where stories I really want to tell <laughs> you know I can I'm not stuck by the by the basic skills um, and then you know get to the point where I know the rules and how to break them kind of thing um, and even just know if it's what I really want to do or do I want to stay in the children's picture book and the comic book world you know that might be so this is about practice and really learning the craft enough to know whether it's whether I want to keep doing it um, because my I do want to have my own show but that's I gotta really love writing these things <laughs> first so right. that's where I'm at and I, I have a much more practical I mean I spent two three years working on my first pilot this show that I wanted to get on the air and I was like, well, let me just get this show on the air and then I can start having fun. Like it was the exact, I'm the, I'm the poster child for how not to do things. <laughs> like I should be like, <laughs> um, you know, just lot, I mean, I've worked on other stuff. I don't want to, no time is really wasted, but it mm -hmm. definitely, that I, I was so caught up in telling this one story and I wanted the community of working with people and brainstorming. That's what I love. That's what I. That's why I wanted to do TV. You know, was to work with people and and build imaginary worlds together. But I was like, I have to get my show on the air before I even do that. It's like I made it impossible for me to even. You know, take a baby step in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so now here are these groups, which I've been. I almost started my own group of like let's pretend we're in a writer's room and create a story on our own because that's what I really wanted to do mm -hmm. and Nacho hosted one of those um, in one of the class where we all contributed to a little mini story and so there's other ways to do that and then just practice in a real practical way and so um, yeah I'm just I, I echo what the woman before me said was just thanks for doing what you're doing so thanks Amanda um, yeah great <laughs> Great comments there. Um, I think it's a good approach to look at it as <clears throat> I have to get my 10 scripts out of the way sort of thing where it's like, I'm, I'm going to, you should still be using your good ideas and you should still be using whatever makes you excited enough to start. But you should also have the understanding that no one starts out good at anything. And like no one's first painting is good enough to go in a museum. And you're going to have to do a lot of paintings before you do a painting that's going to go into a museum. So like you can't get too invested in any early idea because it's probably just not going to turn out exactly like you want it to because your skills are just not there. I mentioned in a, another recent class that screenwriting is like playing the violin. Um, it's difficult and takes an, a substantial amount of effort at the front to get it to make a clear, clean sound. And um, that is different than you know playing the piano where you can just go up and start pressing keys and have it be like, oh, no, that is music. It may not be great, but it's music. No, with, with a violin, you have to struggle to make it sound like music. 
um, and the intricacies of this are so complicated, and the um, the the, the uh, just all the little things you have to know. It just requires you to you just have to get the bad stuff done in order to get to the good stuff. So, um, yeah, awesome. And yeah, the community elements here are very. Uh, you can very much set up your own sort of little writers group or feedback circle or anything like that if you like working in collaborative group environments too. Anyone else? Hi, uh, my name is Josh. Uh, so, a little background: I moved to Los Angeles last year uh, to become a writer, uh, to work uh, in TV and film, and you know, uh, my background allowed me to kind of get work in production. And in the last month, I got a job as PA TV series, and it has been very, very inspiring to actually get my butt off the ground and start writing. Um, and it's a, it's, the series is a sitcom, um, and I had a, a big idea jump into my brain, and I've been kind of just noodling with just writing out some outline notes and working on what I want the show to be. And I was hoping that, and then, and then you guys announced this class was starting. I know the, the sitcom one is starting on Mondays, but I don't think Monday's available because I'm working on this show. Um, so I was figuring that uh, this could work out for me to get get me some structure to, to get this script, this pilot script written. Great. Yeah. And if you're if you're working as a PA now, there's always the possibility that you can get a, get promoted or get close. If you, be, you know, if you work on set, maybe you can start to try to move into office or if you're already office, maybe you can. Uh, after a year or two, perhaps start angling towards mm, seeing if you can become a writer's PA or try to get to know the writers better or like just move towards staffing eventually. Um, but once you get to those, the point where they're like, okay, I'll read a script from you. It has to be really, really great because you're not, you don't want to burn those early chances. Um, so yeah, it's good to get your skills in order and get the groundwork down and make sure that you really know what you're doing. Um, so then by the time you make the opportunity that you need, you can actually capitalize and deliver on it. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Um, anyone else? Your goals for this class or your goal, the thing you want to write or the kind of writer you want to be? Uh, hey, my name is Ian. Hi, Ian. Go ahead. Uh, uh, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, hey. Um, Oh, me? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm Ian. Uh, I am just graduated from college uh, not too long ago. I'm still uh, sort of trying to get my foot into the door of being a professional writer. Um, and I kind of see myself as being really ambitious, possibly a little too ambitious, because with um, the whole writing pilots thing you say you have to have at least a dozen pilots written i have at least a dozen different ideas for tv shows and obviously not all of them are going to get made but i tend to uh for a i'm still well i'm still learning i'm mm -hmm. trying to get better trying to get my foot in the door again and uh i'm the i kind of struggle with writing in some areas where like i'm or like I'm, I'm the kind of person who likes to get everything perfect or as good as I can on the first try, so that way I don't have to go back and do it again. And I'm trying to break myself of that habit because that's really holding me back. But uh, yeah, like a few other people have said, um, I'm uh, really wanting to create my own series. I love telling stories. I really want to do it professionally, and I'm really like trying my best to get better at the craft awesome um thanks so much Ian. um yeah this is a good place to just build those skills and get better at the craft and also you mentioned this sort of perfectionism maybe holding you back a little bit i think it's very common with writers that they want to work really work on something till it uh is perfect and then they just end up messing with the same script for a really long time so one of those major skills to work on is um yeah just the all the writing skills are super important too but also we emphasize the skill of moving on like finishing something and moving on to the next thing that's going to be what really like builds the muscle 
thanks for that, Ian. Um, anybody else want to uh, weigh in? Please, you can use the uh, the text chat as well to introduce yourself if you want to. We're half an hour in, so I just want to make sure we get going, but I'll stop and check the text soon if more people want to tell us about themselves. Um, we just want to make sure we get as much time as possible to go over student log lines. Um, Arctic Fox says we just wanted to check out the event. That's okay. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome to introduce yourself or tell us more about what your goals are if you want, but if you if um, if not, that's all good too. Um, let's uh, let's go into this course to make sure that we get as much time as possible to get to our good content. So this is we're looking at writing a pilot in six weeks. Um, it's really more like eight weeks because we have this one as week zero. So if you're here now, you have eight weeks. And you have up until the, the end of the week that follows our final class meeting. So that's really eight from today. Um, that's about the time frame you want to be able to write a pilot in. So you should be aiming to write like um, projects for your portfolio um, between, well, like six weeks for a half hour show is a good idea, eight to 12 for an hour long or a feature. Um, will this be good? Probably not. If it's your first ever script, almost definitely not. Um, and also, it's a first draft, so it should not primarily be your concern to make anything good. And you need to move beyond the idea that any individual script needs to be good just because, you know, you are making a brick road. You can't fuss over whether every brick is perfect or not. You just need to put the next brick down. So before we begin, you can probably pick an idea for this class that is newer or fresher. Not something you've been attached to for years, though. If it's something you've, you know, if you've had vague ideas for it for a long time, that's fine. But just try not to pick something that's going to, that you're going to be way too attached to if you can. Not something old that you have invested so much time in um, or something that is uh, based on a true story or um, an, 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 like an adaptation of a historical event that you feel the need to get every detail right or something like that. You want to pick something that you can write in six weeks. And your job is to write as many bad scripts as you need to in order to get to the good ones. So um, pick something newer and sillier. Like maybe think of... Some, some mashup of ideas or elements that you always thought would be cool but never thought would get made. This is like a practice script, so you shouldn't expect it or rely on it being amazing in order to get you, you know, to be satisfying or to increase your skills. This is like your first, you've gone to the, the gym and you're just running laps. Um, so we say no true stories, anthologies, rewrites, or adaptations. Uh, just because those things often take much longer than six weeks or people are way too attached to getting every detail right. Um, and we just have a separate class for rewrites, and we're thinking of adding a class for adaptations. So, and anthologies are just like their own separate format that all of these story structure things will apply to each segment in an anthology, not the, like a, an anthological show that has multiple stories in it would just be like the same principles applied in micro several different times. Um, so time travel is really, really difficult. Um, you might want to beware of clones, parallel universes, um, multiple timelines or structures reliance on heavy use of flashbacks such as Lost or um, uh, Sharp Objects or shows like that. You probably don't want to do a historical show because of the extra research that will take unless maybe you already have a great grounding in that historical period or that was your college thesis on it or something like that. Um, as these are all just guidelines and warnings. I'm not going to ban you if you try to write a time travel movie or time travel show. I'm just giving you the caution that we've never seen somebody complete one. Um, true stories, anthologies, rewrites, and adaptations. The only thing that you're actually not supposed to do in this class is a rewrite. Um, so you can make a case for almost anything, and you're not going to – you know, this isn't school. You're not going to get uh, an F or something like that. If you pick an idea, we'd tell you you probably shouldn't. But we've been doing these for a couple of years now, and we have a pretty good idea of the sort of stuff that you should choose for a six-week boot camp. So just believe me. Um, it's a great time to take big swings, though. Try something crazy. Try something fun. Try something you never thought would get made. Um, and remember that 99.999% of shows never get made. So you shouldn't be writing this anticipating, oh, when this is on the air, dot, dot, dot. It's not going to get on the air. Remove those ideas from your brain that this show will ever, ever be made. It probably won't. If you write 20 scripts, the chances of any of them being made, it's still like 0.0001%. If you write 50 scripts, it's maybe up to like, I don't know, 5.5%, something like that. It's extremely difficult to get a show made. And even seasoned professionals pitching year after year after year still sometimes don't get there don't get staffed or don't get shows picked up things like that so don't worry about that stuff your goal is to become a better writer um and also just get used to sharing your work with other students and with me even at the early stages especially if you want to work in tv it's a very 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 social and very collaborative medium that you do not have the option of being cagey or being stingy with your ideas you have to Share them even in their half-formed, half-baked stages and just be, get used to throwing stuff out there. And sometimes it will be shot down and you need to develop a thicker skin because 
I'm, I mean, I'm going to be way nicer than most showrunners will be. So uh, you, you want to get used to the idea that some ideas don't work. And if you're not fantastic at this already, then you may not always have the best instincts or intuitions. And that's okay. You're here to learn. Um, you don't have to for this class, but if you're continuing in the program for later sessions, you should use a real name or something that is a real name, like a nickname or middle name or something like that, just because we can't use screen names in the industry. So you would change your Discord name to something or just tell us what your real name is. It's up to you. But um, that you don't have to right now. But if you want to be in the later ones, please do that. Okay, TV writing basics before we get to the, um, the pilot itself. I just want to sort of speed through this because it's not super interesting, or maybe it's interesting to you, but um, more interesting to me is the actual stories. So let's just talk about the... The, an, a quick overview of the business stuff. TV in the U.S. is usually written by staffs. The staff will consist of sort of m many different ranks in the hierarchy. We have staff writers at the lowest end, um, which are like usually newer writers or they've been promoted up from assistants or they were just staffed and they, they're called baby writers sometimes. And those are overseen by a hierarchy of writing producers because in TV, producers are writers on the show. All of them are overseen by the showrunner who is the head of writing and production and they are the heart and brain of the entire show. They are, they are the show. The showrunner is in charge of everything. Um, the number of staff writers can vary anywhere from just a couple on, like, um, you know, limited series and things like that, all the way up to, you know, 15 or more on big comedies or late night or, or things along those lines. Comedy rooms are bigger than drama rooms. Spec, the word spec, S-P-E-C, stands for speculative, and it means several different things in several contexts. The quickest explanation of this is in features, a spec is a script that you've written on your own that was not commissioned. Uh, in TV, a spec episode refers to a fan fiction episode of an existing show that is currently on the air. Excuse me. Um, and uh, is usually you want to aim for something in its second to fourth season that is critically well liked and enough people will have seen it that it's kind of exciting. Um, or it could be something long running and elemental like CSI or The Simpsons or something like that. You almost never need these things nowadays. They can be good practice and they're a lot of fun to write. Um, but the only thing you can really do with them is enter them in some contests and fellowships. I would not recommend writing a spec episode for this class. This, episode, this class is for original pilots, which is most of what you're going to be writing. A spec pilot is usually just called a pilot, and that is an original first episode of this theoretical series that doesn't and probably will never ever exist. But you're going to use that as a writing sample in your portfolio, which is going to be consisting of three to five of those um, in order to get meetings and get work and to enter contests and to fel get in fellowships and to query management. Um, so there's a couple ways to get staffed on a show. One way is by starting as a PA, production assistant, in which case you want to probably start as an office PA. Uh, after a while of doing that, you will be have the opportunity, if you express interest and you work hard, to be promoted to writer's PA. If you do several years of that and express interest and work hard, then you can be promoted to perhaps showrunner's assistant or writer's assistant, which is actually, it sounds pretty low ranking, but is actually not an entry level job at all. And is one of the most coveted positions in the industry, writer's assistant. Um, and after a couple years of that, you can work your way up through that track and be moved to staff eventually. After, maybe they'll give you an episode, and then if you are if you really nail it, they'll move you to staff. That's a pretty consistent way of doing it, but it's really, really hard to get those jobs. You have to be in Los Angeles for it, and I can't help you all that much with that just because I haven't gone down that path. The other path is by just get really good at writing other stuff. So features, plays. Plays are often looked at by comedy writers, especially in the New York kind of world or stand-up is stand-ups are recruited to, for staffing on late night shows and things like that um there's no point in getting general meetings if you're not a fantastic writer though so while writing those other things and building out a portfolio of other work you should also be writing pilots and assembling a portfolio same as any other case of three to five amazing ones before you actually start submitting anywhere at that point you will try to get a manager by winning contests and fellowships and getting other accolades as well as just networking so Again, you probably have to be in L.A. for this. But in the first, like, I don't know, five to ten years of doing this, if you're just starting writing, you don't need to worry about moving to L.A. yet. Your skills are nowhere near where they need to be. And then once you get this manager, which takes, you know, many years, you will submit your portfolio during staffing season or they will have connections with different showrunners that they might be able to get you read. If you do a really good job at that, you might get meetings that you then have to really nail those meetings. And then, theoretically, you can be staffed on the show like that. Um, so this means that you have to be really good in a room to, in order to be considered in these positions and in order to even do a really good job at those meetings. You have to remember that you're going to be in the room with those people for 12 plus hours a day for several months at a time. I've heard this described on good experience, in people who've had good experiences on staffing. So it's somewhat like summer camp, like everyone really bonds and like you, you, you really get to know these other people that you're staying with and, and working with. And you know, the stuff that drives you crazy about them will drive you extra crazy because you'll be there for 15 hours. So 
you have to have good social skills. You have to be extroverted and well-groomed, or relatively well-groomed, perhaps. Um, good at receiving feedback gracefully and also incisively providing notes that show that you can cut to the heart of what's making a story work or not work in the room and you can break down the problems with it and and explain them or explicate what the issues might be in a very nuanced and constructive way. You should be able to riff off of other people and collaborate well. This is just a very social job. In terms of writing, this is probably one of the more, I think, I'm going to say the most social kind of writing there is. Um, and uh, that's because you got to do it in a room. You have to be with the other people. You, this TV writing is not something that's done in solitude, unless you're writing in the UK system, sort of, which in which shows are written by one person more often than not. So just consider that to write for TV, you must be good in a room. You must be extremely socially capable and have a very thick skin and plan to move to Los Angeles eventually. Um, so, uh, let's skip this slide. This is more on writing movies than writing TV. Um, but yeah, again, always go back to this idea of the bricklayer. You do not have to have every brick be a masterpiece. You have to build a road. Okay, let's look at the six weeks of this course. First, we start with logline. These are the five steps of writing anything that I always teach, and that you should try I'm trying to burn into your brains as the basic, organized, methodical plan for writing something from start to finish. We start with a logline. Or well, really, you start with the premise, and then the first thing you write is the logline, because the logline is a written expression of a premise. Um, so a logline is one sentence that, that tells us what the show is about. Um, who is the main character? What are they trying to do? What are their obstacles in their way? What is the repeatable situation that we're going to be seeing from week to week? week or the second step, I should say, is the sketchbook, and that's the thing I told you to make already. So if you've not already done that, make a new blank Google document and call it sketchbook. And you're going to be including all your unsorted ideas and research material and links and pictures and whatever inspires you for this. Ideas for characters, lines of dialogue, locations the characters will visit. Any of those things need to go in the sketchbook. There's nothing wrong to include in there. Next, we go into story beats, which are the major events of the story, which have been ar arranged in the, um, the, under the umbrella of the structural templates that we're using here. So you should know what your midpoint is. You're going to know where the act breaks are. We should be planning for act breaks really carefully because act breaks in TV are often commercial breaks. And that's what we have to kind of pace around that idea of how do we hook the, re the reader enough to, or the viewer enough to come back after the commercial break is over. So we are really making sure we nail down those story beats quite well. And then we expand them into scene cards, which is that full detailed paragraph for every single scene. And then finally, step five of five is we go to pages, meaning we actually start formatting in with the proper software. Um, okay, let's look at what's a logline. So this is your story distilled down to a sentence or two. That's going to imply some kind of visual action and the inciting incident and the protagonist. It's going to just fill in a bunch of blanks for us and give us a bunch of information. This is not like writing the back of a DVD. You don't have to hook us with questions. You don't have to be like, what happens when blank meets blank? Or who could possibly guess what could happen on this summer road trip? Like, you're not trying to hook us with um, theoreticals or things like that. You have to be very concrete. This is like a handshake between you and the person who's going to read this so that they know, oh, you know what you're doing. This is going to be a concrete story that I can see what the promises being made are early on because those promises that you're making in the logline are things that you're expected to then fulfill or to make good on because the, er the earliest promises you make are your title, your genre, and the logline. Those three things alone will tell us what we expect to see in the episode and what we expect you to deliver on. And if the reader is getting something drastically different than those things, then you need to either change the logline or change the story. Um, so uh, we're going to want to have a sense of who's the protagonist, what do they want, what's in their way, what happens if they fail, that kind of stuff. We have two different types of loglines, though. So feature and TV loglines are a little different, I should say. Um, this is actually more like within TV, there's both series and pilot logline. So, and within feature, there's just one type. So really, there's kind of three sorts altogether. But in terms of TV, Series loglines are emphasizing unique characters and situations and the story worlds that story worlds that promise many adventures within them. So a story engine, we don't have a slide. Do I still have a slide on this? Okay, I'll add a slide on this for next time. But what is a story engine? A story engine is a kind of uh, amalgamation of several different things that is going to feel like it is providing the narrative fuel to continue to generate stories in that world and also the tarmac for that story to run on. I guess the story is a plane in this uh, circumstance <laughs> or in this metaphor, but you get the idea that the um, you want to make sure there is both somewhere for the story to go and also there's enough motivation and pieces in moving that are going to be, uh, it's going to feel like we 
are moving in that direction in a strong and motivated way. So, like, by the end of your pilot episode, if you're writing a premise show, meaning it's more like a movie, every, every episode is a chapter, and we're moving towards some sort of definite ending, then you need to be making sure that you are leaving some threads strategically hanging so that we know, oh, there is Tarmac to continue to, to run on after this episode's over. There are things left to do. There's mysteries left unsolved. There's some kind of enemy left undefeated. We just want to feel like there's more to this. Um, if you're writing a status quo show, which is more something like, I don't know, The Simpsons or um, uh, CSI, we, we want to make sure that we're getting everything pretty much back where it started by the end, and you don't need to leave any threads strategically hanging. So that's why we separate those two formats really carefully, and you need to make sure you know exactly the kind of show that you want to make. Um, so log lines. A pilot log line is sort of similar to a feature log line. We have the inciting incident, the protagonist, what do they want, what's in their way, whereas the series log line is sort of telling us the broader arc of the stuff that we're doing in the show. Let's look at some examples. Uh, let's not look at this template just yet. Um, so I want to look at a couple, before we go into these things, I just want to look at some logline stuff. Um, let's, let's take a look. So status quo and premise, this is what I was talking about before. I think we realize there are two types of sort of continuity formats within TV. There's the type of show where everything resets every week and we, do, we can pick it up anywhere and you never need to worry about what is, how does this connect to the last episode and how is this going to lead to the episode after this. Um, those are uh, pretty tough to do, but they are entirely self-contained. They are a beginning, middle, and end story that um, I think we're very used to seeing those because a lot of what we grow up watching is like that. Like we watch a lot of cartoons um, when we're growing up, which you know we don't want to have the kids have to worry about, well, what happened before this that's motivating this in this episode? Um, and so we're, we're very used to seeing this in, in sitcoms and procedurals. This is really, really common. Um, and then we have on the other side, we have the premise pilot, which is like a long movie. It's, this is going to be your Lost, your Breaking Bad, your Game of Thrones, something like that, where we have to watch the episodes in order to follow the story. And the characters are going to change very incrementally, but very drastically over the course of multiple seasons. In status quo shows, they may not change at all. They never really need to. Okay, so that's a pretty big distinction to make right away if you're going to do one type of show versus the other. So on your sketchbook, you should write that down, which one you're doing. Is this a premise or a status quo pilot? Um, so the things you should have by now are title, genre, and continuity format. Um, if you're still not sure about any of them, it's okay, but at least we've gone over what those things are. Um, let me check the chat to see if we've had any questions so far. On, uh, I'm not sure what, ser or what streaming... Um, service that's or what streaming site that's from but hawkeye 4077 says i just found the server today because i was looking for a server that i could learn about script writing and learn to become more professional in the line of work i finished a sci-fi superhero script and trying to make sure it has the correct format i want to spice it up and make it the best it can be i'm open to tips or information great well thanks for joining us hawkeye this is a place to learn about pilot writing this is like pilot writing 101 so we have many more classes in this course coming up if you want to write a pilot from beginning to end in just six weeks this is a place you can sign up and attend the rest of our classes in the course or you can just hang out for the rest of this free one, which goes on for the next hour and 10 minutes or so. Um, let me look in the chat uh, a little bit here. We have, um, Marcus says, I want to write episo episodic novels. There's a trend for episodic storytelling in novels and novellas. I'm hoping to write them as scripts and then flesh them out as episodes slash chapters in novels. That's interesting. Very few people write scripts first and then adapt them into prose afterwards. It, it does happen and like it's not impossible to do. Um, it doesn't, it, you know, I am also moving in the direction of starting with screenwriting and then moving more into prose over time. So I think that is valid and that might definitely work, um, but uh, it's, um, it might be a challenge. It, it's going to be a unique and interesting challenge for sure. Amanda says, I love riffing with others. Uh, it's like the thing I like most about this. I almost can't think when I'm alone. Yeah, and if that's the case, then you might just be a very collaborative writer and, and working with other people in a group setting like this can be the thing that gives you the fuel Jack Stringer in our chat says, I don't plan on making this a job, but I want to expand my writing. I've written cop creepy pastas and fanfics in the past. Okay, sure. I mean, if you're just a hobbyist, then you may not need to sign up for the full course. You might just want to hang out on our Discord server and our free channels and events. Um, but uh, yeah, these, these courses are oriented for people who want to do this, uh, you know, at a very high level uh, for a living, ideally. Um, but either way, you know, we're, we're, this is open to all skill levels and we're open to hobbyists too okay so um let's so we've gone over premise and status quo let's go back to log lines a little bit and i want to just show you some examples and um 
maybe talk format of them a little bit and just to give you like 10 to 20 minutes to work on these on your own as I'm continuing to go through the slides. Um, so I'm just going to give you this for now. Um, this is the logline template for the pilot episode. So if we have to have two loglines for your show, one of them is for the whole series. And that one's a little bit broader and a little bit... Um, uh, it doesn't have to be as concrete in terms of your character's tangible goal that they're working towards. It can sort of describe a much bigger overall journey. But then we have the pilot logline. So there's two loglines you'll need. In the pilot logline, you're expressing just what happens in that opening episode. And that's going to look a little bit more like a movie logline. And it might look something like this. When or after the inciting incidents, an adjective protagonist must conflict before stakes. Um, and you can swap those out. It might be ticking clock, or you know, it might be before slash in order to something like that that just tells us what is the threat, what is what is creating the sense of urgency and motivation in this story. So this is one sentence. Try to boil this down to one sentence. You can do two, but every time I see two, I'm almost always like, you should have made that one. Um, so start working on this now when or after inciting incident that's the one thing that sets the story in motion so think in your pilot episode if it's a status quo show it might be that they get the case of the week so your inciting incident might be you know when a deranged serial killer um starts cutting off people's earlobes in malibu whatever it is just specifics of that thing of the week right um an adjective protagonist so an alcoholic detective must conflict must you know uh investigate and stop the killer before in order to stakes or ticking clock before they before the killer cuts off his you know favorite nephew's earlobes whatever the actual stakes are that are causing our character to need to do this quickly um so for a premise show this might be more like the event that sets off a long series of other events in the future it's not going to be a thing of the week like thing of the week format is very status quo show so it's case of the week or crime of the week or medical um mystery of the week or um legal issue of the week something like that so if you have the phrase of the week in your show's description that's a status quo show but for a premise show it might be an inciting incident that's setting off the series of much more uh much broader scope events that are going to be powering the rest of the whole show so it might be like you know when germany declares war on america a you know what is it marine a, a, a young medic joins the marines and must blah 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 so that inciting incident might be the thing that kicks off the entire rest of the show um so start working on this start fiddling with this um you don't have to post these yet but in about 20 minutes we're going to be posting what you've got and you should look in the chat because we just um have a great macro here that has posted a bunch of examples of log lines for you to look at um and these are going to be these are all series log lines so this is the 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 thing that so right up up here, this is the template on the screen you see in front of you for pilot logline. If you want to know what a good series logline looks like, check the chat. Um, you don't you don't have to have both. You can just do one or the other today. Whichever one you're more confident about, um, just work on that for sharing in about 20 minutes. So yeah, keep working on those loglines, and we want to see uh, what you've got soon. It does not need to be perfect. Okay, um, let's uh, let's keep going through our slideshow a little bit. I'll give you guys. Um, let's say we'll post those at uh, 10 after the hour. So um, be working on your logline. I've gone over sketchbook, so you should you can be fiddling with your logline in your sketchbook. That's where I would do it. Um, you don't need to make a separate document for it, but there's no right or wrong way to do this. You're going to just include snippets to brainstorm, dialogue, setting, story, information, photos, drawings, anything that inspires you. Um, if your script if your script takes place in a different country or culture than yours, you're going to want to do a little more research. If it takes place in like a fantasy world, maybe it has certain rules that you need to know. Um, so this is just where you're gathering all of your brainstorming. Um, the next thing we will go into will be after we finish with these things. So this will be in two weeks will be these story beats. So we'll look a little at structure. We're not going to go too deep into this now because I'd rather spend the time on log lines. But I just want to give you the a, a preview of what the course is going to be like. So you can see all these numbers here. These are all referring to pages because a half hour pilot is going to be 30 to 35 pages long. An hour-long pilot is going to be 60 to 65 pages long. Those are the options, really. There are other types of TV writing out there. You might be writing, like, adult swim cartoons that are, like, 15 minutes long or something like that. But for the most part, the formats that are accepted are going to be half-hour or full-hour. 
Um, we have some comments in the chat. Somebody says, I don't see the stakes in some of these log lines. That's because these are series log lines, and these are usually going to be a little broader and not focusing on the urgency as much as the pilot log line would be. The series log line might just... Sometimes when you see even professional versions of these, they're just like, you know, a... Um, a dysfunctional family resides in, you know, what, Malibu or something like that. And you're like, wait, so what's the conflict? But when we get to the pilot logline, sometimes that the stakes and urgency become a little clearer. Um, okay, so feel free to take a look at what we have here, which is the 30-minute pilot structure. So we have a cold open at the beginning, which is going to be just that. Uh, you don't have to have a cold open, but you can. That's, you know, before the credits. We have about one to two minutes worth of, if it's a comedy, it might be just uh, your main character um, being introduced to the sit problem or situation of the week, or maybe it's them being denied something that they want, or just running into some kind of problem that then the rest of the episode is going to be then try them trying to resolve. In a comedy, your cold open might also just be your characters hanging out and doing something funny, and then we get to the opening credits, and that's where the story really gets going. Not really a, a super strong rule in what you need to do in a cold open, but often it's going to introduce the problem of the episode. Act one, 10 pages. Act two, 10 pages. Act three, 10 pages. You have to pretty you, like be as close to on the dot as you can because in TV, page counts matter a lot. And um, you have to make sure that you are um, hitting these... Like, if you're a page or two off, uh, if you have one act that's nine pages and one act that's 11 pages or something like that, no one's going to throw it away. But um, you're planning, theoretically, for commercial breaks and for a format of writing that is very dependent on strict time slots. So you should show that you're able to do that. Even if your show, you're like, this wouldn't even have commercials. This would be on HBO. Well, first of all, you can't really decide that as you're writing it. You can write a show without act breaks if you really want to. But like for the most part, you should write them in because it's just a skill. We're in a boot camp, and you should learn the skill of doing it. And it doesn't disrupt the flow of an episode at all. If you're doing it right, it should feel like a natural, organic element in your story. So um, act one, 10 pages. Act two, 10 pages. Act three, 10 pages. Then we end with a stinger. It's like one page or maybe up to two that's going to be... If it's a status quo show, often this will just be the characters that we like doing something that we like. So the two funny side characters from your comedy are just hanging out, um, talking crap in the break room or whatever. Um, or if this is going to be a premise show, we, the stinger is often going to hint at what's coming next week. So it says, although we beat that bad guy... Imagine we're doing a half-hour superhero show like Justice, Justice League. It might say... Although we defeated that bad guy, we're going to watch him in the stinger. We're watching him crawl through the rubble until he gets to his, you know, big red button that he presses. And now he's like, I'm summoning the League of Evil guys for to take these Justice League members down. And he presses the button and we sort of see a quick montage of like all the bad guys that are going to get him next week. So it might be something like that. Um, really just depends on your format. There's not one thing you have to do with the stinger or cold open. Sometimes the stinger is even like over the credits or after the credits or something, something like that. Um, so, do we have a question from somebody in the chat? I've, I've been hearing some mic sounds. <clears throat> oh, maybe not. So make sure to uh, keep your keep your mics muted, uh, unless we're, you have a question or comment, or unless we've called on you, um, in which case you're free to speak. Okay, um, so this is half hour format. Don't worry about the specific things in here yet. We have Catalyst, Trying the Locks, Break 2, Premise Scenes, Midpoint, Escalation, Break 3, All is Lost, Pit of Despair, and Finale. If you don't know what those things are, don't worry too much about it. Think more about the idea of your show right now. But let's look at just the very basics of story structure. Act 1 is the setup, Act 2 is sort of the confrontation, and Act 3 is the resolution. Normally, in most forms of storytelling, Act 2 is much longer than... Or, sorry, I should say in three-act format. Act 2 is often much longer. So in movies and in hour-long shows, Act 2 is longer. In a half-hour show, each act is the same length, but you should still think of the middle, the confrontation, the Act 2. That is the show. So... When you think of what would be in the poster or on the trailer, that's the sort of stuff that we want to see in Act 2. If we say, this is a story about a guy who does this, Act 2 is where he does that. So think of Act 2 as the show. 60-minute um, format, I'm, not, again, not going to go over the whole thing, but you can take a look if you want. We have way more pages. You have twice as many pages to work with, meaning we have five acts. Really, it's three acts because, you know, if we slice it up, the middle section is the sort of Act 2. The be it's like beginning, middle, and end. No matter what the numbers are on the page, always think in terms of three acts. So um, in this, every act is 12 pages. We have 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. And then we open, your cold open might be up to three, your stinger might be up to two. Um, you don't have, again, you don't have to have either of those. And if the page counts are slightly uneven, it's okay. It's not gonna be the end of the world, but this is generally what you're aiming for. So the midpoint is sort of like a cliffhanger at the end of your act three. And your act five is sort of like 
the finale of the episode. So you get more time for finale in 60 Minute. You just get more time for everything. Um, okay, so that's just like the incredibly basics of structure. I want you to just be thinking, start thinking in terms of these page counts and page numbers if you've not already done so. And if you're coming from novel writing or short stories or something like that, you're probably more tuned to think in word counts, but in scripts, we're talking page counts. And the general rule is going to be a page is a minute, a page a minute of screen time. That's not always the case, we understand, but it's the best metric we have. I have not heard a better metric. So unless you've got a way better one, that is what we're going to have to imagine for the most part. Um, okay, so uh, time slot and format, 30-minute um, shows, remember 30 to 34, 35 pages. They're usually comedic, and they're usually highly episodic. There's a ton of exceptions, so that's no longer a rule. We have everything from horror, dramedy, dark comedy, thriller, drama, everything. We've seen everything in half hour, um, so there's nothing you can't do, but just understand what the expectations are and what the norm is, that these will be comedies or very highly episodic shows. Um, 60 Minute is, they can be pretty much any genre except comedy. The one thing you never see is hour-long comedy. If there ever is an hour-long show that's funny, it's almost always mixed with something else, like a healthy dose of drama, or there might be something like uh, crime elements, or it might be like um, a musical. Like, th think of an any hour-long comedy will have something else going on in it, some other flavor. You don't see hour-long comedies just because the genre can't really... Sus it. I'm sure it could, but just the way that we are used to these things working is that we expect that it would have trouble sustaining its plot for a full hour and retaining audience interest and just audiences are expecting comedic stories to be half an hour long there are lots of hour long shows that have lots of funny moments in them so don't feel like you can't write any jokes into your hour long but just understand it should not be a there's no hour long sitcoms for a reason other formats we won't really be touching 15 minute like web shows and cartoons and things like that 70 plus minute would be like limited series or mini series we're just not going to really cover it because you should learn to do a really good hour long before you try to do a mini series and then we have things like variable length like streaming shows um on on streaming networks like disney or like you know mandalorian or obi-wan or other newer shows which are, they're kind of the wild west there's not really rules of as to how long they should be or need to be um so uh yeah don't worry too much about those your options are basically um half hour or full hour we have a comment in the chat. An example of 45-minute comedy is Gilmore Girls, but it's technically a dramedy. Yeah, or we have what's Crazy Ex-Girlfriend on CW. That's an hour long, but it's also a musical and also in some ways a dramedy as well. So, yeah, there's going to be an hour. You don't see hour-long sitcoms. I don't think they exist. Um, okay, so any questions about time slot or format? or anything we've talked about so far. Hi, everyone. How do you determine the length of your pilot? Is it based more on how many people are there? Like how many characters you have and the complexities among them? Yeah, good question, Carmen. So how do you determine what your show wants to be? Does it want to be half hour? Does it want to be full hour? Um, and that's sort of the key, that's at the heart of it, is what does the show want to be? Um, and so you have to look at the elements that you have and determine how much space and how much breathing room those things need to properly develop. You're also going to look at genre. First of all, if you're doing a comedy, it should be half hour, um, like I mentioned uh, in this last um, point. But uh, yeah, the things that will inflate the page count that you need, amount of ground covered by your character, so amount of you know different locations that they're visiting or just amount of scenes you want to have. Um, number of characters that you want to get to. If you have a broad ensemble with 10 main characters, you're not going to pull that off in half hour, almost certainly. Like, in half hour, you're maxing out at around, like, how many characters... If you only have 30 pages, that's, like, how many scenes per act? Like, three or four? Five at the most? Um, that's, like, between 12 and 15 scenes. It's just not a lot of time to flesh out a bunch of characters. You can, you're can going to max out at, like, three or four characters that you can really get into and explore in a half hour pilot um you're you're not going to get much out of more than three or four characters uh in an hour you can probably double that you can give me maybe six or seven you know, main characters that you get a lot of good stuff out of and that you introduce a much broader tapestry of events so you have to just look at the scale and the scope of the story and what it wants to be 
is this an epic? Is this a story about someone traveling a long distance or meeting with a lot of people or networking with a government or trying to assemble a new nation or like any of these things that are just going to require a broader web of people, relationships and like ground to cover. And so I think you just have to kind of add up all the factors like that and figure out, you know, what is going to suit this the best. The easiest thing to do is just look at similar shows and just say, my show is kind of like that. So you should probably do it in that format. That would be my rule of thumb. The protagonists have a direct relationship with um, the entire ensemble cast. Oh, they don't need to at all. No. Um, it's helpful if they have a direct relationship with most of them, but they don't need... There's plenty of shows. I just watched the um, the, uh, the pilot of We Own This City, which is a crime drama on um, HBO. A bunch of the characters don't know each other. There's like four main groups of characters. One, of, Some of them are lawyers. Some of them are cops. Some of them are criminals. Some of them are both. Um, but like, uh, you know, no, they don't need to know each other at all. But ideally, like the, you know, the, you should consider that the more diffuse the web gets, the harder it gets to tie things together. Um, so like it, it will add challenge to yourself. The, bro the broader the scope of the events and the more characters and the more things you have going on, the more challenge you're adding for yourself. Um, so just, just something to keep in mind. In the chat, Jack okay. Stringer asks, are cliffhangers a vital part of a pilot episode? Um, cliffhangers are great as act breaks. I mean, we want the, we have to, you're asking the audience to sit through five minutes of Subaru ads and then come back. And that's actually a lot to ask someone when we have so many distractions and so many things that they could be doing instead. And everyone's got a phone in their pocket and you're lucky if they're watching without the phone in their hand, looking at it the whole time. Like, um, so I mean, you should think less in terms of cliffhangers and, and more in terms of reasons to keep the audience watching because if they are not being drawn in with every act break and with every scene, they are being actively pushed away. There are so many things competing for your audience's attention. We, it is our job to entertain the audience for as long and to like use their attention for as long as they are willing to give it to us. And we have to understand that that's, a not, that's not a super easy thing to give or to ask for. So... With cliffhangers, think of what are ways that I can keep the audience coming back and I can make you say, you don't want to change the channel. You have to come back after this commercial is done and see how things play out or conclude. You can call it a cliffhanger if you want. I mean, uh, at, in terms of the ending of the story, like leaving things unresolved, uh, premise shows should end with some element of cliffhanger in the sense of we know that the battle's not won, there's something still coming, there's some threat on the horizon. And if you're doing a thriller type show, then it should be more urgent. Um, and it should actually pr perhaps even end with your character in a dangerous situation. That's okay to do. But um, if, if it's a status quo show, you want to wrap everything up and not leave us on one. Not Don't leave us on a cliffhanger at all. So in a status quo show, you can have them as the act breaks, but don't leave us at the end going, wait, but then what? It's If it's status quo, we need to resolve everything by the end of the episode. Um, thanks for the questions, guys. Good questions this time. Any other questions on time slot format or anything we've talked about so far before I move on? Um, I have a question. Um, does have you ever seen Diorville? What was it called? One more time. Diorville. Deerville? The Orville. Oh, the Orville, the the sci-fi show. No, I I've seen trailers for it. I know what it is. It's like a sort of um, light-hearted Star Trek type show, but I've never actually watched it. I mean. Uh, yeah, because um, I'm guessing, does that count as a hour-long comedy, despite it being, like, um, purely, like, a Star Trek-like show? I would not say so, because it, it's a it's like a Star Trek-type sci-fi show that has a comedic tone. I wouldn't call it an hour-long comedy, though. But then again, I haven't seen it, so I don't, somebody else can feel free to weigh in on that if they want to. But I'm I'm guessing from the trailers and materials I've seen from it that... It has much more substantial sci-fi style plots than you would think a regular sitcom would have. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so what else? So in about five minutes, we're gonna be posting what you have of your logline. Um, let's look at genre first though, um, just to make sure we have this down because like I mentioned, I'm, I've just been kind of surprised. A lot of people are like, I think my genre is this. So you need to know what your genre is. This should not be a question at all for you. Um, these are basically the options. There might be oh, some... Can I ask one oh. more question? Oh. Sorry, can somebody have a question? question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just... Um, and I know, I kind of know the answer, but for example, you know, Monk is an episodic, uh, kind of light, um, you know, procedural mystery mm -hmm. um, with the murder of the week. 
Yep. But there are some arcs, right? Like him finding his wife, the murder of his wife is an arc. But, um, I mean, I guess you could even say Friends, which is like super, super standard mm -hmm. comedy format. There are some arcs, right? They refer back to previous episodes where... Sure. So, um, I know that now with a little bit of the Wild Wild West, like you can add more... Um, arcs over seasons and 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 the series um, without it being serialized or is that the right word yeah so um, I guess to play it safe would you just say stick with episodic if you think you have some overarching things but you don't plan to have it continue each week say episodic with some you know, overarching arcs yeah, so a lot of episodic status quo shows have some sense of development as the show moves on. Like, very rarely, sometimes, but very rarely are they going to be, season one is exactly the same as season ten. Something, something like The Simpsons right. actually is the same. Like, the characters do not really change in The Simpsons, ever. Right. Um, because they don't age. Because right, right, right. They're, they're cartoons. So, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but, so, but just because some shows like you said like friends or community or any of these other any sitcoms that have arcs or things like that those are all so incremental and they're all they all take like seasons to occur you shouldn't worry about them when writing a pilot for a show that's never going to get made right right but as far as just telling you what genre it is i'll say episodic yeah 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 if if you're like i want the characters to change yeah. and and to evolve over time even slowly can I not do episodic? No, you definitely can. You, yeah. So think you're, you're thinking. I think you already. Yeah, you're correct. You have the right idea okay. that um, characters okay. can still change over the course of these. Um, it shouldn't change to premise just because you're like, oh, the characters will evolve. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Touch of the poet says Buffy is also an example of monster of the week while having season long arcs. Yeah, exactly. Um, I can also bring up the stream chat. Um, but let's uh, before I do that, let's look at the genre options. So we have comedy, drama, crime, sci-fi, and fantasy. Some people lump those together, but I think they're distinct enough that we do need to look at them separately. Action-adventure, pretty much the same thing, in TV at least. Mystery slash thriller, a uh, lot of crossover. There's very few what I would call thriller shows that don't have mystery elements, so there's a lot of, you know, people will consider that kind of the same. And then horror, which was not even a genre of TV like, I don't know, 20 years ago. But with shows like The Walking Dead, um, they've really brought horror storytelling into the mainstream, you know, Haunting of Hill House, all these things. So it's now a distinct genre of TV that has its own sort of unique structural requirements and beats. And horror on TV is its own sort of world. Um, but it's absolutely a thing. Um, then we have procedural that are usually going to be based on institutions like police, medical, legal, or other things like that. They don't have to be. Like, uh, maybe you have some other idea for what a procedural could be. Sometimes there's like a fantasy procedural like Angel, which was a spinoff of Buffy. Um, then we have animated, which are usually going to be 30 minutes in either comedy or action adventure. They don't have to be, but that is what they normally will be. So you should boil this down to just two genres mashed up at the most. There's nothing wrong with having one. Nobody's going to say, oh, just a comedy. That sounds boring. No, if they make comedies, that's what they want to see. So um, we can boil all of these down to just one or two at the absolute most. You should not be adding a bunch of genres and say, well, it's a sci-fi, fantasy, action, mystery, horror, thriller, drama. No, after a certain point, it just starts to sound like a soup of nonsense. You have to just stick to two things. So, I mean, Game of Thrones, fantasy, drama, Big Bang Theory, comedy, Walking Dead, horror, How I Met Your Mother, comedy, Supernatural, uh, I always struggle with this one, but this is like, uh, I'm going to say mystery thriller fantasy. Um, so yeah, you get the idea. We get what you, you can look at any of these shows and just define them by two things, even if there's a lot more going on. Because what is Supernatural? Really, it's sci-fi, fantasy, action, adventure, mystery, thriller, horror with some comedy in it. It's kind of everything, um, but you have to boil it down to just two and try to pick the most elemental genres by looking at what is the emotional promise that that genre is making and what is the, what is the sort of appeal um, so different genres have different emotions that they're trying to access because storytelling is like a, a way of hacking our brains and finding whatever emotions that, you know, create certain endorphin type responses in us. And we're trying to deliberately create those situations by simulating that, that, emo that thing happening. Um, so you should know what the appeal of your show is. If you're like, uh, not sure now's a good time to ask, is anyone unclear on what their show's genre is or should be?
could you remind me of what Monk is? I mean, he's a police procedural, but it's funny. Is it, how yeah, would you it, say that? It's a procedural mystery with a comedic tone. Okay. Sometimes you it's call just it a, a police. Would you call it a police procedural or a? Uh, no, he's he's he's, he's not he's not a police um, officer. I don't or a police detective. Isn't he a private? Right, private but he works with the like Castle's another one where right. the main character is a murder mystery writer. Mm -hmm. But he teams up with a cop. Since, Same since thing they're, with bones. they're, they're, they're basically cops. acting like detectives, regardless. So I would yeah. just—it's still—it's—it's it's not. I wouldn't cool. call it police procedural unless your main characters are using. Oh, I know. The Maybe detective. You can use detective, detective if you want. Yeah, sure. It, that's like the subgenre cool. of mystery that it is. Okay. Cool. Anyone else unclear on their genre or have any questions about genre? Because we're about to post log lines in just a minute. I'm. I'm one of those people that's confused by the whole genre thing. Um, I have, I guess, I'm thinking a supernatural thriller. We talked about it yesterday. Okay. Which is not any of the, um, those logline descriptors yet. And I have a lot of work to do on it. So I, I need to, even for other types of writing, I'm trying to get clear on these genre rules mm -hmm. um they each have their own rules and so i think um, my question is where does pharmacia fall on that based on the log lines that i have that we talked about yesterday i guess it it, it could be like supernatural thriller or supernatural fantasy i mean there are a lot of some of the scenes there are could fall into horror or thriller. Um, so, so you'll have to repost. There, if you, can you repost the logline? It, it'll be just a little easier to 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 give feedback on it if it's right in front of us. Okay. But generally, like it's yeah, gonna... you have it's the you have to look at the overarching picture, like the big picture. And you can't get lost in, mm -hmm. well, that scene was funny, so is it a comedy? Or that scene was scary, Do is it horror? You have to look at the bigger picture of what the appeal is overall and what the sort of elements are that are informing what the genre is. So, like, mm -hmm. uh, fantasy mystery or fantasy thriller, it sounds like that's a totally valid combination of genres that exist. Um, it Just because it contains notes of other things doesn't mean we should at start adding a bunch of other descriptors to it, though. You need to just boil mm -hmm. it down to what are the basics of the emotional appeal, so... That would be the, the you know, mystery element. The characters are trying to solve a question or resolve some kind of complicated problem. Um, and we have the fantasy part telling us the way they're going to do it is through supernatural powers. Um, that's all you want to leave it at. You don't want to overcomplicate because otherwise it's going to feel like when you go to the frozen yogurt place and you're like, oh, pineapple looks good, kiwi looks good, chocolate looks good, caramel looks good, M&M's looks good. And then by the end, caramel, M&M, peanut, you know, pineapple does not sound good anymore. <laughs> Right. Um, so supernatural is not a genre. No, people actually. use, I mean, it's fantasy, really. People will use that word supernatural to mean fantasy, usually in con in conjunction with thriller. Sometimes they use the word paranormal, which um, has some of its own connotations to it, but this is all just, it's like fantasy is the easiest way to think of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to posted that i don't really want to um take up too much of the time of this class on it because i'm really focusing on the yellow river and i don't want to take up space in my brain mm -hmm. on this right now if that's that's okay sure sure yeah that sounds good so just based on this a pill addicted teenage girl with astral projection powers that tells us one of the subgenres is fantasy must destroy the demons behind a pharmaceutical doomsday plot a defiant 16 year old girl must learn to harness her powers to defeat a specific okay so yeah that's going to that to me sounds like that is going to be um fantasy thriller or perhaps um it just depends on like how your character is confronting the problem if, if she's approaching it like a detective i would say fantasy mystery or fantasy thriller if her way of defeating this demon is we need to lock and load and kill the demons that it might be fantasy action so just think of what tactic is she using to confront them and that's probably going to tell you what that second genre is okay thank you sure thanks for the questions so hopefully everyone can tell what genre they are playing around in. We know what kind of stuff we like. 
we know what we've seen we know the basic rules that come with it and the expectations and you should just be a big fan of the genre you're working on i wouldn't recommend writing a genre you're not familiar with at all because then you're going to run into pitfalls and you're going to be doing stuff that is cliches for that genre and that'll just dock you it'll work against you in a way that we don't want to do okay um we're at past the time where i want to do log lines let's post student log lines in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can i always get to everybody um so even if i need to stay a little bit late so um let's post them now and see how many we have to work with please feel free to post either your series pilot log lines or both if you have both um please include the title and genre i'm going to put the uh, template slide back up Here it is. So that's what your pilot log line should look like. If you're not sure what else to do, use this. And I'll start when a few people post. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Gray. And as soon as one or two more people post, then we will start reviewing these. And while we're talking, you can still be working on yours, and you can still post yours, and we will still try to get to everyone. So I'm going to be giving feedback on these and also marking them up. So be prepared to hear feedback and also to unmute and answer questions. This is a good place to start on these skills I was talking about of receiving feedback well. It is a skill to receive feedback well, so do be trying to you know, attempt to improve at that. Um, not everything's gonna be perfect. You won't start uh, out amazing at this and that's okay. Um, Ian says, can I post too? Because I haven't decided yet. Yep, go ahead. Um, thank you for posting a little twerp. All right, I think we're gonna start going through these and then um, we will uh, just keep rolling through them. So, sorry, I missed, I could not understand what the comment somebody just made was, but feel free to use the text. We're gonna start um, going down these in the order that they were posted. Um, so I just gave some feedback to uh, Carmen's. Let's take a look at Gray. Um, Gray, is, do you have a text version of this that you can paste? Yep, let me put that here. And this is called, is there a title? What's this called again? Sp Sp uh, Spiegel, isn't it? Yep, sorry, I uh, can't have the stream up right now. How does that look? Thank you for that. Okay, doke. Can you read this out for us? This is a dramedy called Spiegel. Mm -hmm. Series logline. A reclusive violinist and three other musicians with wildly different personalities set out to win a chamber music competition. All right, awesome. Read the pilot. When a painfully shy violinist is offered entry into a collaborative music competition, she must gather the courage to join a group or else resign herself to the depressing safety of isolation. All right, thanks for that. Some nice word choices here. Some This feels specific. Um, I'm going to read these back really quick just to make sure everything's working. A reclusive violinist and three other musicians with wildly different personalities set up to win a chamber music competition. They're all in school together, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So I would think that you would want to draw the connection between the relationships here. So a reclusive violinist and her three classmates or three members of her you know see what i mean if we can just it's not they're not just random strangers so if you can if you say like they're all attending the same school or they're all in the same class or they're all in the same orchestra just try to link the characters a little bit more okay. when a painfully shy violinist is offered entry into a collaborative music competition she must gather the courage to join a group or else resign herself to the depressing safety of isolation so it's low stakes but they actually feel substantial for the character i like how you have phrased it the only thing is she must gather the courage to join a group sounds like an internal process that is probably accomplished before the halfway mark of the episode right um so unless the is the whole thing her trying to join this group or does she actually join the group in the pilot uh you're probably right it right. does need a different um 
Mm. So frame it around the primary action of the second act. I think it's less that she's trying... The whole episode is not about her trying to just gather the courage to join this group. It sounds to me like she's struggling to work with the group, right? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. She yeah. must... Yeah. Adapt to blah blah blah. If you can phrase Something it... Something pretend. Can, can you phrase it in terms like she must overcome or she struggles to... Like, um, try to frame it in terms of this is going to be an obstacle that your character has to actively confront head on. Okay. Yeah, I can try that. Great. So frame Thank main you. character's struggle as actively as possible. Besides that, this sounds like a specific world, and like um, uh, I like a lot of the uniqueness of this. And although the stakes are quite low, I am still invested. So I think this is working well. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, thanks for posting this, Amanda. If you wouldn't mind just copying and pasting the text from this into the chat as well, Amanda, then it would, it'll be easier to copy. I'm, I'm having a hard time pasting. It's hmm. coming, when I pasted it, it asks for an image. Let me try and take all the formatting out of it. I'll, I'll repost. Hold on one second. Okay, thanks for that. Are you on a tablet or on a, a computer or something like that? It might be... Uh, I'm on a Mac in a Mac. Word. I'll, let me see if I if I strip it of formatting. Let me see if that works. That I'll should try work. Again. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Um, we want to make sure to get to as many as possible. So let's um, go to Josh. Josh writes. Go ahead and um, read out your log lines for us. Also, what's the title and genre of your show? Uh, the working title is Rewind. Okay. Uh, it's a comedy status quo um, with comps of spaced clerks, fears, okay. um, workplace kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the series logline, a group of diverse video store employees seek relevance amongst a dying industry, bizarre customers, and their own personal conflicts through inspiration of their favorite movies. Uh, okay. Pilot logline, on, on, her, on her first day at a video store, a nervous, movie-obsessed young woman must learn how to fit in amongst weird employees and even weirder customers before the end of the day. All right, thanks for these. So, um, is this set in? Uh, this is set in mod like a modern day sort of one of these tiny little video stores that still are clinging to the remains of the industry. That's the sort of idea. This isn't set like in the heyday of the video store. Uh, I haven't decided if it's either modern day or that kind of. 2007, 2008 era when mm -hmm. it was really starting to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Blockbuster was like um, folding up because Netflix was killing it. Exactly. Right. Either way it works, I think maybe just that was a question. I was like, wait, so is this a, di a dying industry? It's been a dying industry since 2000. Yeah, oh, since yeah, the, yeah. the 2000s. So I wasn't quite sure what that meant for this it, show. It started as a 2007. That was the first thing thought in my head when, I, when it came into my head. Okay, so maybe include that, or maybe hint at that. Okay. Um, okay. What does it mean to seek relevance? Well, I, you know, that was, it, it, it can, <laughs> to feel as though that you have, you know, a, a place in the world, to feel as though you have meaning um, in whatever way that is, in, in your personal, professional, you know, feeling as though you're succeeding. Mm -hmm. feeling as though maybe with um, you know, you're, you're falling in love, you're dating, all those things that kind of make you feel like a person or not like a person. <laughs> okay. It's it's just, um, and like, in a series logline, you have room to be a little broader with the conflict. I mean, you should prevent, present us with a slightly broader conflict. Um, but my only question is they're just employees at a video store trying to seek relevance amongst a dying industry. I'm not totally sure what that means. Are they trying to revitalize and I, save the business? No, they're, no. Uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, ha, it, you know, there's personal experience here of working in this field in that era mm -hmm. and feeling like, um, well, this isn't what I'm going to be doing forever, mm -hmm. but it's what I love to do. Um, this is what your main character feeling, loves to do? They, they're they passionate about working at a video store? Or they're passionate about movies? They're passionate about movies, and to okay. them in small town, 
that's the biggest and bestest thing they're going to get to, you know? Oh, so do they want to be filmmakers? Maybe. That could be it, yeah. Um, this is just providing a little more context and motivation and, like, attachment for your characters, right? If we say sure, they're em yeah. they're just employees, but they're trying to seek relevance, I'm like, wait, so they're trying to save the video rental industry? I'm not quite sure exactly what that means in terms of yeah, these no. characters in this situation, so you might just want to specify a little bit like if they're like uh one of them wants to, one of them is the owner and he's like i need to save the business or maybe your main character is like i want to make movies i don't want to be stuck here in the store something like that we're just looking for a little more concrete character goals even in the series logline i know that it, it can be a little broader but even within that i'm like what are they actually trying to do sure uh, um and the pilot logline on her first day at a video store first day working at a video store perfect or a video store job something like that um, a nervous, movie-obsessed young woman, okay, must learn how to fit in amongst weird employees and even weirder customers before the end of the day, or else what? Why do you have to learn in, learn know. to fit in by the end of the day? <laughs> yeah, so that doesn't quite feel I, like yeah. uh, s sure. false stakes, perhaps. I mean, the you should try to frame this around something that, like, what is the actual goal for the episode? This is an you've given us just the internal goal, which is I need to learn to fit in with these other people. But what, what are they actually trying to do? Is it like, we broke the gumball machine and there's gumballs all over the floor and we need to clean this up yeah. before the boss gets here? Or is it like... I haven't um, that one out yet. Right. Or there's a bunch of tapes. We need to rewind 100 of these by the end of the day. Or all the movies got mixed up or all of them got... You know, what 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 actual task does the main character have to accomplish is more what you're going to be okay. laying out in the pilot logline. And through that, we will come to... We will understand that that internal journey that you've suggested will interweave with that external one. So we will <laughs> we will get, if you're like... With her new employees, they need to bond together to put the store out when it gets cutters on fire before the manager gets back. <laughs> we will get, okay, sure. so that's going to be the story of how she comes to bond with these and fit in with these other people. Okay. But the external journey is so important because if we don't have that, we don't know what we're watching. Yeah. Okay, so I'll say cool. externalize. Is that with a Z or an S? It's an S. Or, no, it's a Z. S would be British, I think. Externalize um, <laughs> the character's goal and this will imply it to interweave with her internal one perfect any questions on this no uh, you laid it out exactly how i needed to hear it i i you know i i was the 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 conflict i was struggling with <laughs> um of trying to figure out what the conflict would be but i think Thinking about it in those terms definitely helps. Awesome! Thanks so much for this. This is um, so this sounds unique. This sounds cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, more to get to. Let's look. At, I'm just going straight down the list, so people who were quicker on the fast draw have a slight uh, leg up here. If I've missed anyone, let me know in the chat, and I I will get to everybody by the end. So you know, sometimes I scroll past somebody or something. So. Don't worry if that's the case. Let's look at Lil Twerp. Um, do we have a title or genre for this show? Please include title and genre <laughs> um, for your show. Go ahead. Uh, title, working title is No Campaign, No Gain. Uh, genre, political comedy thriller. Um, after being caught stuffing ballots, a newly, a newly unincarcerated campaign manager is forced to take a job helping an unpopular nerd wing class president in order to be hired by the boys mayoral father. Okay, wait a minute. Is that what I'm looking at here? Uh, I changed it. Oh, you changed it. Okay. More, uh, more specific stakes. Okay. Um, did you paste it in the chat, or can I copy and paste it from somewhere? It right yeah, thank you. So, uh, and what was the title? No Campaign, No Game. No Campaign, No Game. Thank you. So this does not sound like a thriller to me. I think maybe we're getting a little confused on the genre definitions. This you said political comedy. That so yeah, th I think this would just be that is a, a sort of, sort of, political is sort of a su yeah subgenre of several different things. Mm -hmm. But this is sounds like just a straight comedy to me. Okay. Um, thrillers usually imply life and death, you know, really intense edge of your seat kind of plotting stuff like that. Um, so after well, let me paste a new version in. This is is unincarcerated a word? Are we sure of that? No, definitely not. Okay. Uh, there's definitely a better way to say that. Okay. Um, Newly released from prison. 
Right, right. I get, I get what it means. I just wonder if there is a word. Um, okay, after being caught stuffing ballots, so like trying to cheat at an election, I guess, a newly uh, freed campaign manager is forced to take a job helping an unpopular nerd win class president in order to be hired by the boy's mayoral father. His mayoral father. His dad's the mayor, is what you're saying? Sure. Okay. Yes. That's like describing the president as a presidential man. He's, oh, no, he's just the president. <laughs> Um, by the boy's father, the local mayor, I think is how you'd want to phrase that. Okay. Um, class president of what? A high school? Yeah. Sure. All right. Um, and so your main character is going to be going to this high school to help this nerd win his, ele uh, like, class election? Yeah. I guess what I'm thinking is the boy, the mayor hires him to help his son win the class election mm -hmm. he has a trust as a test run to be hired for uh the mayor race okay I, I think i'm with you um does the kid want to do it or does he not want to uh i think the kid wants to he does want to okay but he's unpopular mm -hmm. because he's a jerk <clears throat> yeah i like jerk I okay that's good I'm just looking for, if there's a central relationship there, then mm -hmm. we want to hint at what the conflict of that is going to be a little bit more. If this is going to be like the show of, I don't know, your main character, but let's say her name's Jessica. So if this is going to be like the Jessica and Patrick show, then we're going to want to know um, a little bit more about what's causing that conflict between them. So all we've said is that he's an unpopular nerd, but you might want to suggest why he's an unpopular nerd to, to sort of give us a hint at what that specific journey is going to be. So specify conflict, perhaps, I would say. We understand that making a nerd win in an election would be difficult, but if we understand what his personality type is, that's like the central relationship of the show. It just reads to be, it's very important. It reads as very important to me. Um, and then in order to be hired by his father. So if his dad is in, wait, his, if his dad is hiring her, but his dad is also in charge of hiring his kid. Are you saying his dad will only hire his own kid if his own kid wins this election? No, I was hoping that the dad would hire the campaign. Right, right, okay. So I, I see what you mean. I I guess the question is, uh, it seems like in the logline that you are... Hiring the kid. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I think I see what you're saying. You're saying that if the manager succeeds that... at this... Then the manager will get a job with the with the mayor afterwards. Is that right? That's right. That is yes. right. Okay. Okay. Um, so is that going to actually? That's not actually going to come anywhere near happening. In the pilot, though, Mike, I would guess. Pilot. Yeah. So, um, is forced to take a job helping an unpopular nerd win class president. I would say less in order to be hired by the boy's uh, father, who's the mayor, and more like, uh, she's already been hired. <laughs> She's she's gotten a job. Like this is if this is a job, you're you're sort of saying this is to gain favor with the boy's father, who's the mayor, something like that. Um, otherwise, it's just a little confusing because it sort of sounds like when she's hired to do this, she's trying to accomplish her goal so she can get hired again. It's like wait, she's already working for him, but you mean in a better job? Okay, so I would say something like to gain favor from his father or to get influence with his father or maybe just make this a little broader. Gain influence or. Um, favors something like that and um we understand that once your main character does that maybe they can get their legal oh actually maybe it's to get her legal record um expunged have you thought of that hmm. I like just an idea i don't know if you can actually do that but uh in a comedy you probably could <laughs> all right any questions on this No questions? All right, I think we're all set then. Thank you so much for volunteering this. This sounds cool. Thank you. Let's keep it going. We've got a few more to get through. Um, we have, uh, let's see, what's next? We did twerp, we did gray. We did, um, let's look at medical. So Jack, do you want to read this out for us? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
Yes, just something that I'm actually writing right now at the moment, and it's a uh, medical horror type sort of screenplay that's uh, basically about a cancer patient who has um, been offered a life-changing surgery that is promised to cure cancer. But um, like after the surgery, he wakes. Yeah, but it's gonna sort of go like after the surgery, he wakes up in a in like a room unknown to him and um, basically starts to sort of discover he sort of starts exploring and he discovers the dark secrets behind um, the medic the treatment center I see okay thanks for this a cancer patient is offered a life changing surgery but he'll soon learn everything so we want to avoid phrasing things like but soon blank, blank will happen you want to say all in present active tense for the most part um, he soon learns Everything is not what it seems, and he discovers the dark secrets the treatment center holds. So there's a couple phrases in here that are just sort of um, uh, vague and unspecific. Everything is not what it seems. The dark secrets of the center. Whereas you want to give us a little more information. So phrases like, it will be worse than he could ever imagine. Or like, the consequences were so, so, so dire. Like, it's better to use your words that you have access to, because we don't have a ton of words to spend on these, um, on more uh, specifics. So if we say something like um, a cancer patient receives a life-changing surgery, but soon he finds out that the people, you know, the people running the hospital are a cult. He needs, uh, they're a cult. He needs to figure out the, you know, how to defeat this cult that is now trying to control him through the implants they put in his body. Something like that. Just give us a little more. Don't worry about, oh, I'm going to spoil the reveal or I'm going to spoil the twist. You should spoil a little more. Because so much of the hook with horror is the threat. And um, if we don't know what the threat is, then um, it's tough to bring in the audience. It's tough to, to get a horror audience excited by a logline that just suggests dark secrets. Because it's like dark secrets are a mainstay of the genre. We're looking for the dark secrets of what? Of this cult? Of this robot uh, or alien collective? Or this, what is it, AI? Like what? We just want to know a little bit more what we're dealing with. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah. I will definitely incorporate that into <laughs> into some of it. Cool. Yeah. So, um, the a cancer patient also maybe just consider um describe who your main character is a little bit more. Because a cancer patient doesn't imply personality. Um, who they are, you know, more fundamentally. A job that he like we we can often start with a job if you describe someone as you know I gave this cliche example earlier an alcoholic detective well that's a cliche but it works because it tells us uh, the job detective tells us what their skill set is what they do all day and what resources they have access to and the adjective that you choose I chose alcoholic tells you something they'll be struggling with or something that will be informing their tactics that they use in the world um, so give us a little more on your main character like who who is he or she. Um, and what are things that are going to make this the only character that should be going through this situation? What is going to make this story relevant to your main character? Why should it happen to them and not anyone else? Uh, yeah, I haven't thought too much about it yet, but um, I, might, I might probably um, think about adding more details to the main character. Yeah. Great, okay. That's, um, that's my notes for now. Any big questions on this? Okay, if there's no questions, we'll move on to the next one. Thank you so much for that. I was medical, right, okay. Um, let's keep on going. We've got a few more and we've got about 20 minutes to, we have, let's see, there's looks like two or three more. Um, we have uh, Amanda. Oh, good, you got the text to paste. Let's do stepping out of the blue. Okay, so I'm, so last time I was in this pilot class or, you know, the beginning, I was working on that wizard one and I couldn't figure out the series versus the pilot. Mm -hmm. Meaning I was like, well, the first episode could actually be the premise of the series. And I was flipping and flopping. And then I thought, let me just start over again mm -hmm. <laughs> with an even easier um, and even more simple premise just to practice writing this pilot. Okay. Um, so I, but that said, I, 
haven't fully thought this through, except that it's um, whether, the, okay, so I'll just read the series log line. Mm -hmm. uh, a theoretical physicist turned police department consultant is a whiz at solving mysteries, but viscerally struggles to handle the day-to-day -day of the job, like seeing blood or dead bodies. And the comps are like, you know, Monk is a, a OCD, you know, that hangs him up at every, you know, corner he looks. Mm -hmm. But he can look at blood and gore. Like, he doesn't have that problem with his OCD. Right. And this is more someone who's squeamish about, like, stuff that... I thought that... I thought it could be kind of funny, because you don't have a lot of... Sh well, like, maybe Brooklyn 911 does a little bit of that, and Psych occasionally did that. Mm -hmm. um, calling out the things that all the other shows take for granted, which sure. is, like, actually seeing dead people. <laughs> you know? Right, right, like, right. Well, that's, like, their hang-up, kind of. Um so he, that's the premise basically um mm -hmm. and then the pilot i haven't s summarized this but i'm just going to tell you the plot in the not great you know that's in okay. the, not in the sexy log so after losing her obscure high-paying job as a theoretical physicist a woman must make ends meet to maintain her lifestyle and pay her bills uh mortgage student loans car loans but struggles with finding another equally paying job because she's so specialized. Um, you know, all the other jobs are like entry level. And the only job that she can find that pays even close to what she needs to pay her bills is for a police officer in training. Um, she like jokingly kind of applies to it and then passes the first round of tests and then starts to think, wait a minute, let me see. And that's why I have this and then because it's like so then she get, she either so the what I'm debating on is she either gets the job um, as a police officer in training or she winds up being in training well actually so the job so this is a job I actually applied for when I couldn't find a job and there was a police officer in training job in Santa Monica that paid like ninety five thousand dollars a year and I was like wow you know and i passed the first test and I, and then my friend was like well are you sure you're going to be okay with going to accident sites and seeing like bits of brain on the ground and i like almost threw up and i said no way <laughs> but then i thought that's a really good show <laughs> like or you know just a fun show and so um so you know so i that's as much as a of real life experience i know i'd have to do some research but if, if the police officer in training job you know, they have a apti aptitude test, so she'd have to either fudge her fear of blood or, you know, I haven't figured all that out. But mm -hmm. then um, the other option is that she's in training, say, even she goes through the whole training in the first episode, and she doesn't want to become a police officer, but she's such a wizard at it, they decide to contract her. So either of those could be options. Either she becomes a real cadet or you know she she's such a whiz that she, and then in that case i'd have to find okay her partner needs to be that opposite conflict but this is something right. that I, I i can there's a real model to just so almost like throw things in the slots <laughs> you know? you're right you're and, right mm -hmm. so, anyway so what i just yeah that's where i'm at so that's a my long-winded kind of figuring this out right now but yeah, yeah, it's all good. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so, the uh, the main the the main comments that I have here, I suppose, are that you're in you are in familiar territory with police detective or consulting detective has to solve crimes, bringing some sort of new interesting POV or like some some new perspective or, or approach to this that the regular cops don't have. So therefore, every every week they're gonna solve this using only skills that they could bring to the table. I'm with you there. Right. The setup is a little hard to buy. Regular police officers are not the ones who are responsible for solving mysteries. So her right. just joining right. <laughs> a, a training program, yes. Yes. I struggle yes. to get that she's going to get far enough to become the person who we look to to solve the mystery to make this premise click into place. Your alternative would right. be... Uh, a central relationship will probably make this much easier. Because think of something yeah. like you yeah. know Sherlock Holmes... Like, have you watched yeah. Sherlock, the the modern one? No, no. I would definitely watch that. It's one of the biggest shows in this sort of genre. And also, it, it yeah. solves a lot of those problems. And it, it takes the Sherlock Holmes character and it recontextualizes it in a modern format. 
so that it actually makes sense how there's this guy. He's not a police officer. He's a consulting detective. That's not really real. Right. But um, in the show, he's like, yes, I know it's not a real job. I invented it. I'm the only one in the world. Yeah. And, like, it's sort of... Yeah. It makes sense that this guy who's, like, such a good amateur sleuth actually... The person who hires him is Lestrade, who's the police, uh, like, I don't know, chief... The inspector that he's always running circles around, right. basically. Right. And Lestrade is like, right. my relationship with Sherlock has allowed me to believe, I, I believe that he's going to help us solve the crime, so I'm going to hire him personally and bring him on. And that way it kind of makes more sense that he can skip through the, Ooh, we're getting a lot of feedback from okay. your mic, just so you know. Okay. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, we're going to get, uh, a lot. you might make this click into place easier if you have a central relationship that can help us bend or break the rules. Um, because oh, the rules okay. in, in place in this world are so complicated um, that uh, you probably want somebody to help you cut through some of the tape, and that also gives you great room to have that second character who, you know, in every one of these, we have your, you have your Watson, you have your, I don't know, he teams up with some lady in Castle. I've never seen Castle, but, like, some actual police officer. Somebody that right. brings the opposite end of the spectrum. Because if yeah. he's a theoretical... Think of what's the opposite of a theoretical physicist. Um, and there may not be, like... Right. There may not be one concrete answer to that. Yeah. Sure, the forensic forensics. person could be like the person that is really dealing with the blood and the gore and the just the facts and the theoretical physicist is is thinking about the implications <laughs> you know of the facts right um, I, I guess my other question is so we're looking for a detect detective that brings something unique to the crime solving process if you look at something like the mentalist um let's what's I've, i dated a girl that made me watch the mentalist what was the actual i watched though? the mentalist <laughs> psych ncas bones castle monk over and over again <laughs> right right okay so this is similar to psych he uses his former career as a psychic and i can mm -hmm. understand how you're going to use those skills to solve crimes but with theoretical yeah. physics that's a scientist who uses mathematics chemistry calculations biology and theories to understand the complex workings of the universe and interactions yeah. between matter and energy. But if we're solving right. mundane crimes, I'm like, I can't even think of one example of how, can you give me one example of how a theoretical <laughs> physicist would bring their perspective to a crime to save, to solve it and save the day? Um, well, maybe like there's some sort of intuitive gift that a theoretical physicist has hmm. where they cut through some of the they they le make these big leaps that um you know like well of course you know it's the person with the most i don't know something where it's it's theoretical so it's abstract so you can bring an abstract theory down to earth so they don't have to be it doesn't have to be science exactly like theoretical physicist i mean a th I mean, meta, even you could call it a metaphysicist or something. Um, you know, the, the person could have been doing a real, real cryptic area of physics because physics goes into almost new agey stuff at a certain extreme. Right. So, But then yeah, the question becomes, I, why is this not yeah. just a, a police detective who ha who is really into theoretical phys physics? Like, why does it have to be somebody who this is their whole career, this is their whole life? Like, It's um, a good point. Yeah. yeah, if it's, it's just, just going to be the mental process that they're using, if it's just going to be like, this yeah. character thinks in this specific way, then this could be anyone. It doesn't have to be a physicist in that case. So I think we're looking for, and you know you have a basic working premise when you're like, oh, I can totally think of some situations that that would come in handy in or resolve. And with this, I'm like, maybe there are, but I can't think of any. Um, so I guess that might just be a flaw in the premise where we're not designing right. it in such a way that we can understand what those case of the week type of things will be okay. um like think of pu pushing daisies for instance pushing daisies is a fantasy mystery procedural type show every case of the week the, the main character can bring people back to life for one minute so i'm like oh i can totally see you can bring the victim back to life and ask who killed you or you can um bring some other you can bring a dead uh um like a body back at the morgue and ask about their specific expertise right if you need an expert to yeah. consult you go to the morgue and you bring the fireman back to life and now you can t interview a, a guy about fireman stuff like I can think of all kinds kinds of games that you can play with, you can bring people yeah. back to life for one minute. But with theoretical physics, I'm like, unless we're solving sci-fi based crimes, huh? Then how is this going to apply? So could this be sci-fi right. based? Right. That's a good. Yeah. It could. And, and that's what I just was thinking now. Is like maybe I should go a little more X Files ish here. Yeah. Like, have you seen Fringe? That's a lot like that sort of thing. Uh, I have seen a little bit of it. I think. Um, it was a little too intense for me, but um, yeah. 
X Files is another great comp though. You can comp X Files even though that's been off the air a long time because everyone knows what X Files is. Um, so yeah. maybe consider yeah. changing to if you want to use theoretical physics, you may have to change your plot lines to be more sci-fi based. Right, right, and and actually to be honest, the the where this came from was like. I just wanted obscure job. Like, mm -hmm. so at first I started with anthropology, you know, or archeology, span you know, some theoretical archeologist who, um, it, the point is that the job is very so specialized that you can't find another one and you're not qualified sure. for anything else, which is a pretty kind of a cliche thing for a lot of PhDs. Mm -hmm. And so, um, which is, which I think creates the believability because it really was a real situation, so it has to be that, that that someone might be so desperate to pay the bills that they'd go for a police officer and training job. Right, right, um, right. And then, um, so that's sort of how does she even get into it? But now I see your point, which is, okay, but she needs to bring something to the table that no one else can. And so yeah. let me, I'll think about that and then see where I get. Yeah, I mean, so. if there's if someone's been if someone's been stabbed to death and your hero's like, but dark matter is uh, moves at twice the speed of light. Everyone's like, there's a guy stabbed on the ground. What are you talking about dark matter for? Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, so good ideas there. Just needs to maybe okay. just take that sliding tile puzzle and just twist the Rubik's cube a little bit until you find oh. some working elements there. Good, good. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. All right, looks like we have two more. We have. Um, uh, Marcus and Ian, if I've missed you, let me know. Chime in in the chat. I want to make sure to get to everyone. We're probably going to run 5 to 10 over time. Um, let's start with Marcus. Open to monogamy. Yes. Can you read this out for us, please? Uh, yeah, let me actually find here. Oops. So the... Um, actually, I can't read your screen. Hold on, let me go to my screen. Oh, Sorry. Yeah, I can zoom in as well. There we go. Okay, there we go. So uh, it's called Open to Monogamy. And uh, so I think it's episodic, but it's kind of like Sex in the City where there's, you know, how I would write it is I would write each series as one book. So, but it's kind of episodic. I don't know. Anywho, um, it's a comedy slash dramedy. This one would be uh, gay. That'd be the tar target audience. Mm -hmm. Comps would be like Sex in the City in that it's really a dating show and it's a show about relationships. Sure. Uh, also, Looking. I didn't see all of Looking, but I think it was along the same things except gay. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to say gay Sex in the City. So uh, so the series blog line is after falling in love with an open-minded European, a serial monogamous tries to adapt to his first open relationship with Oh, that should be a comma there. With the help of his attached, various attached and unattached friends. Nice. In actually, short, no, there's the no comma. Your, the grammar looks fine, actually. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. Not confusing that. Okay. <laughs> so then the pilot, uh, the long line for the pilot is uh, after being invited online for a mysterious job interview, an American writer wanting to stay in Europe must land a job at all costs or risk being forced to leave Europe and the new love of his life. The new love of his life. All right, thanks for that. Open to monogamy. Okay, so let's look at the, so your comps and the, it sounds like you know exactly what kind of show this is, which is good. So like you have a very clear picture of, of the format and how this is gonna work, except for maybe you're, you're not sure if it's status quo or premise, but th that's okay. Um, let's look at the basics first though. Because like this kind of show, sometimes it rides the line between them because it's like, well, one relationship has ended. Is that the end of that arc? Or like, it, are they gonna come back later? Who knows? So, um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> after falling in love with an open-minded European, a serial monogamist tries to adapt to his first open relationship. So, after starting a relationship with an open-minded European, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Right, so it's more than just falling in love. You're, you're not saying these are two separate people. Okay, so after... Uh, no, it's, well, I no, mean, falling the, in love does the matter. The character falls in love with the open-minded European. Right, but then you say so adapt to, adapting to his first open relationship meaning with the same European? Exactly, yeah. Right, 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 okay. Um, so do you see how those could be two separate things, though? Like, that after falling in love with a European, a guy tries to adapt to his first open relationship with someone else. But you're saying it's the same person, so I would just maybe try to link those ideas. You might just have to... Uh, a serial monogamist tries to adapt to their, create, to their polyamorous relationship, something like that. 
with the help of his attached and unattached friends. Well, those are the only options for friends that exist, I think. So with the help of his friends, I think. I'm just wondering why we say attached and un unattached. It's a kind of a play on the title. The title basically will talk about relationships from open relationships to monogamous. So open to monogamy. And he's trying to figure out, is he open to relationships? Is mm -hmm. he really more open to monogamy? <laughs> and right. His various friends are attached and unattached. They all, you know, they're so, everyone kind of is a different uh, representation of a new form of relationship or an old form or whatever. So I want it to be like attached and unattached. Like one of the friends is desperate and unattached and, mm -hmm. you know, do we really want his advice? And that kind of thing. I don't I know see. if it makes a difference. Maybe, some, maybe something like his unlucky and love friends or maybe his like, um, uh, I guess you're saying, but I, all you're sort of saying is they have various statuses of relationships. So I'm just wondering what is a better way to express that. That, um, yeah, and they're I, I'm not sure like I know yet. For him. Mm -hmm. You know, one is a relationship that's an open relationship that looks happy. I'm like, oh, okay, that could be the happily ever after. And then another one is open and they're miserable. Another one is single. I see. Okay, so I'm with you, but to me, it just sounds like with the help of his friends is the be is the, still the best way to describe that because your only description for them is they have they are not the same. They have various situations going on. So I'm not sure what the answer is yet, but just think of a different adjective for the friends, perhaps. Okay. Pilot pilot logline after being invited online. I'm not sure online is relevant here. After being invited for especially. If you say he's invited for a job interview, it sounds like he travels somewhere to take the interview. An American writer wanting to stay in Europe. So he is in Europe, and he gets a job interview in Europe? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, I would just... I would not describe him as wanting to stay in Europe. I would say an expat American writer must land the job at all costs or, be, or risk being forced to leave Europe and the new love of his life. Okay, I think that mostly works but wait after being in so the job would not be in europe the job he is in europe but he's getting a job offer that would force him to go to somewhere else yeah, so i see him as either like a student and basically students have a year after they graduate here mm -hmm. to find a job or you have to go home right and so basically he's fallen in love he's decided he wants to stay there and now you know he's got this job interview and it's it's towards the well, you know we'll find all this out in the pilot it's towards the end of his um the towards the end of his visa or whatever and he either has to land this job who has you know hopefully will uh sponsor his visa or he, he's mm -hmm. just out of there and you know the relationship is over every basically the whole european adventure is over oh okay wait so i'm sorry i i may have misunderstood um the job is in europe and he needs to get it or else he has to leave i i think i see now exactly okay um, why is it mysterious then? Why have why have it be shrouded in mystery? Well, this is this plays to you know that he's finding his way in this open relationship, and so he gets invited through a profile uh, that they have online together. And this is based on somebody I knew, and I just thought it was the most bizarre thing. And the whole thing is they got invited online <laughs> based mm -hmm. on their profile uh, to like a hookup company, and then the what the job was was mysterious we were all tuned in to figure out so did you get the job what is it yada 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 so that's like i kind of have the episode kind of roughly plotted out but part of part of the episode is like you job is for <laughs> and it's under kind of false pretenses because it's under this profile that you know there's a there's a real question why the heck who who chose him based on the profile, especially because the bro profile is kind of an anonymous or a fake profile or kind of a, not a catfish profile, but, and so, I don't know if there's, there's, I don't know, the situation is kind of a mess and that's emblematic of how he feels. So this is, this is reading as a problem to me because if the job seems so mysterious and strange, then I'm struggling to invest in your character trying to get the job at all costs. I think it should probably be less... We're not trying to piece together the mystery of what the job is. That's not the focus of the show as you framed it. The focus of the show is on the relationships. I think you should probably pull back on the mystery here because you're implying that it's more important than it seems to be. I would say the more relevant thing is that it's like a dream job, or at the very least, it's the only way that he'll be able to stay here. But if the focus is on the relationships yeah. and not on piecing together the mystery of the employer or something like that, I think you're just distracting us from the core. 
okay. You know, and, and it speaks to what you said about how Act 2 is, is what it's about and what mm -hmm. we will find out in Act 2 that, oh, this really is a dream job. You know, he'll find out what the job is, why they selected him, and then it really is, turns out to be this dream job that he does really want. Okay, so it's only really a mystery for one act. So, in that exactly, case, yeah. I wouldn't even describe it as in, in, in those terms. Um, gotcha. So, yeah, this okay. is a, when he's offered a dream job, a writer has to attempt to get it at all costs. You're saying Europe every time? Europe's a continent, though. What country are we talking about? Well, you know, I was trying to make it, in a weird way, vague, because, you know, I was, I was thinking, imagining, okay, maybe this could sell in the local market here. And mm -hmm. the market here is so European, and it kind of... I, I almost want to be able to, like, plop the person anywhere. They can be in London. They can be in here in Amsterdam. I was just going to set it in Amsterdam by default because I'm here in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. But I've also lived in Germany. You know, they can be in Berlin. You can kind of set it. Basically, it's a person. It doesn't even have to be an American, but it's a person who's a fish out of water in almost everything, including their relationship, but trying to make that work. So... Okay, I see like, what you mean. Um, I, I, I see what you're trying to do. I guess it just we prefer specificity to the appeal of we can put this anywhere. We'd rather like because if if they're gonna change your show, they're gonna change the show. Um, so I would just pick an actual country because the cultures are very different. Europe is not all the same. Um, and uh, Amsterdam, we, I would think. Amsterdam, sure, yeah, just put but yeah. give us Amsterdam. Though. We we like specificity. So um, tell us where we are. Cool. Um, any questions on these? Are you asking me? Yeah, from Marcus first, and then from anybody. <laughs> Go ahead. All set? Yeah, no, so, so, oh. oh no, yeah, go so, ahead, yeah. Okay, just so I can uh, be clear. So mm -hmm. we're saying that we should change the, um, be specific about the city, mm -hmm. and then uh, reveal the details. Okay, that's good for me, just for future log lines and things. As well. Yeah, I would pull back on the mystery, tell us that it's a dream job, be specific about the city, maybe reframe how you're describing the main character's friends. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you for that. Yep. All right. Um, do we have <laughs> Gray says the fast and the poly curious. Thanks, Gray. Um, do we have Ian? And do we ha if we have anyone else that I've not gotten to? Um. Let me know in the chat. We're probably going to go five, ten more minutes. Let's have Ian read out his log lines for us. Mr. Slick, your name's Ian, right? Or was I calling you the wrong name? Are you there, Mr. Slick? Maybe you're muted and you need to click the gray microphone icon in the bottom left of the screen. Or maybe you guys can't hear me. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, I uh, might just have to read this out on my own in that case. Let me see if he's commented in the chat. Okay. Um, I'll just give feedback quickly on my own. If you're not able to answer questions, it won't be as in-depth, but I'll do what I can. Um, okay, so 50 things to do before parenthood, uh, comedy with romance-ish elements, okay. Um, series logline, upon hearing, upon learning they're having a child, a free-spirited young couple sets out to complete a bucket list of things they've wanted to do before becoming parents. Okay, sure. Pilot logline, a young couple worried about becoming first-time parents set out to accomplish one last major thing. Well, it's not really one last major thing, is it? Or unless you're saying that this one last thing expands into a list of things by the end of the episode. So we just want to know what thing. What are we doing? What are we watching the characters do in the pilot? Oops. Um, what else? Uh, upon learning they're having a child, a free-spirited young couple Sets out to complete a bucket list of things they've always wanted to do. Okay, so your series logline looks totally fine. The pilot logline, I think we need a main character. So this should be, are we, I know you, a couple shows do exist, and often they have elements of two-hander, but the pilot, who are we focusing on? Whose show is this? Is the, I would guess it's the pregnant wife's, but it, you know, maybe it could be the guy's. 
Okay. Can you hear me now? Hi, I can hear you now. Okay. So, I'm glad that we have you on voice. Maybe you can answer the question. Who do you see as the main character in this one? Uh, I was kind of seeing them both as being co-main characters. Mm -hmm. uh, but probably more of the wife, because uh, with the other side characters in the story, like she has a sister who also has kids of her own, and she's like, the sister character is very like, busy and a little bit uptight and she sees her younger sister as being like a little too rambunctious and not taking things too seriously so when she the younger sister realizes she's having a kid of her own she sort of starts to worry about like oh man my life's gonna be boring and tough and stuff just like my sister did and she starts to worry about that mm -hmm. okay i think i'm with you i think this is a good basis for a show but in terms of, like I said, specificity is so important, and we're left wondering at the end of this, what is the socioeconomic status of these of this couple? What environment is this? I, see, all I'm imagining right now is generic sitcom, middle class, white suburbia. But is this set in like the the actual environment that we're in is going to really affect like how your characters go about this, isn't it? Take a show like My Name Is Earl, which might be another good comp for you because that's a sort of guy needs to complete a list of tasks type show it's set in like lower class deep south and that's really going to affect how he goes about accomplishing those goals right so think about maybe hinting at who these people are in terms of the resources they have access to the jobs they have the environment that they're in the location that they're in anything like that that can just give us more than i'm just imagining generic sitcom okay cool any questions on this one uh, no. Uh, did you see that I left um, two? Because I can decide. I'm probably going to write this one because the other one I'm more familiar with. But yeah, I left um, two log lines. I didn't see the other one. I'll give it a quick look. But just we're 10 minutes over, so I will have to uh, be pretty speedy yeah, with it. Let me scroll up and find it. Um, what was it called? Dead Mall? Yeah, that's the one. Okay, I'll take a quick look. Um, I won't be able to do the full Q&A question and answer thing just because we have to wrap up. That's fine. But let's take a look. Um, Dead Mall. I love the title. Comedy, fantasy, horror. Just try to pick two. Just pick two. Um, a college student takes a new job at an abandoned mall overrun with monsters. This sounds awesome. And most adapt to his new environment and co-workers while trying not to die. A dorky student tries to perform flawlessly on his first day at his new monstrous job. Well, the job isn't really monstrous. It's the uh, threats at his job that are monstrous in order to avoid getting killed. Um, I really like the idea. I'm guessing, is this a whole, this sounds like a whole separate world where monsters are somewhat common and accepted, or is this, uh, like, it, um, go ahead. Uh, it would be sort of like, it's an urban fantasy idea where, like, the monsters are in modern day mm -hmm. sort of thing. Like, if, if I could, I would make this animated to, like, really play that up, but yeah. I see. Okay. And are there scare sequences? Or is this meant to actually scare the audience? Uh, sometimes, yeah, but not really, no. It's meant to be just sort of be like a workplace comedy just with uh, monsters and like all sorts of things that are scary to say it. Like, things that are normally fine to us will be like dangerous and destructive in like that world like what's normal for monsters is scary and destructive for humans okay so i would take horror out of the description if this is not primarily concerned with scaring the audience this sounds like a fantasy comedy but that's okay okay um that's all good so if you're gonna ask me which of these premises i like better i like the one in the mall with the monsters because that's just my area of interest um whereas the other one sounds like it's a it's a functional sitcom we've seen shows like this before um, and I'm, I, I would just wonder where that hook, wh what's really going to make me go, oh, I've got to tune in for that. Because with Dead Mall, right away, I'm like, oh, I've got to tune in for that. But that's just me. Maybe somebody who watches a lot of sitcoms or rom-coms or something would be more drawn to the other one. So uh, I would urge you towards the Mall one, but it's totally up to you. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thank you for um, posting these and for participating. Everybody, um, it takes a lot to share these unfinished ideas sometimes. 
Um, Logan says, I know the class is almost over. Can I get a recording of this? Yeah, it's online. This is already being streamed on YouTube and stuff. You can just rewind the stream on YouTube. Um, so we do have to uh, wrap up now. I hope I've gotten to everyone. I'm scrolling up. I'm not seeing anybody telling me I forgot them. So uh, we are going to wrap up now. Um, thank you all so much for coming. We will be doing this for the next six weeks. If you want to sign up, remember scriptcamp.net. And uh, you will have you can sign up for a free trial for membership, meaning you get two weeks of unlimited everything um, with membership. Uh, their unlimited membership comes with access to every class, every boot camp, every lab. Um, and uh, we um, offer a video library too, which has recordings of every class we do. Go ahead, Nacho. Oh, did I hear Nacho say something? Maybe I just imagined it. I imagined it. Okay, no problem. Uh, no, that wasn't <clears throat> that wasn't me. But, <laughs> it wasn't um, you. Okay. But here's a poll. You can just. Uh, oops, that's the wrong poll. Sorry. Sorry. So yep, we have a little poll in class um, or in the Discord chat that you can weigh in on if you are planning on signing up but have not yet done so. Then you can get immediate access to our chat channels and video library. Um, so uh, sign up for your free trial if you want to be in more of these. Let's look at what to do for next week. So for next week, refine that log line. You Hopefully, if you had one, you got feedback on it today enough that you know some things to be working on and changing. Um, you are going to want to uh, read a complete script by next class. Um, we just have a link in the chat with access to tons of pilots for you to read. Um, let me see. Here we go. So uh, you want to read a complete script from beginning to end, a complete pilot. You want to revise your series and pilot log lines. And that's it for next week. Um, so you can also be filling out your sketchbook. You're not going to turn in the sketchbook next week or anything like that. But um, be adding ideas. Be brainstorming and thinking of characters and situations and scenes and all this awesome stuff that's going to be in your show. Be thinking of the cool ingredients, even if you don't know how they're going to be fitting together yet. But these are the tasks for next week. Revise those log lines. Read a pilot. That's it. Questions from anyone? All right, if there's no questions, we'll wrap class for today. Thank you all for being here. We will see you soon for something else. I think there's table reads at two, right, Gray? I'm on my laptop, but if you can hear me, I hear yes, you. there are. <laughs> okay, so pretty soon, table reads in the server with Gray um, at 2 o'clock Pacific. That'll be every, uh, every Sunday at this time. So um, submit your scripts. We'd like to see you at a new class or at another event soon. So thanks to all for being here. Um, have a great rest of your weekend.